A popular session of the conference will start in a moment. The OW2 Project Spotlight will highlight nine projects this year. I'm delighted to welcome contributors from Telosis, Knowledge, Lutes, Ville de Paris, Actor FX, XWiki, Centrion, Emix Workflow, and LemonLDAP NG. But let's start with Boris Van Giel, Community Lead. Please, gentlemen, let us know the state of Rocket Chat in 2022. Hello, my name is Floris van Geel, and I have become, in the past 12 years, an open source fanatic. What is that, an open source fanatic? At a certain point, you find out that there is actually free and open source software, which is beautiful. You just can take it, use it, play around with it, and make it work for you. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have a problem. Those problems you can capture and write down and make into an issue. The issue goes into an issue queue, and then either you or somebody else will find the solution and make a nice pull request to... Uh, be added to the project and that's how we all work together and make open source but there's something changed there for me in 10 years ago 12 years ago uh, it was actually in 2010 when i visited a local uh, get together local conference uh, around at that time uh, drupal cms i was making a decision uh, been building websites at the university uh, for the faculty and some clients in order to pay for my allowance and my rent. And I was making a decision where it's, which is the one open source that I'm going to build websites on. So I was there and it was so friendly and so welcoming and I felt so at ease, uh, like belonging to a group that the same year uh, in summer I took the car and drove from uh, Eindhoven, where I live, to Copenhagen to join and collaborate in the big Drupal conf conference. That's actually a normal participation. Um, but currently it is like way ramped up that I usually I don't take any non-open source software anymore on my computer. Obviously the operating system is not fully open source, but the most of its components are, and you can add more layers to it with that, getting all the Linux and all the open variants in there. And I really, really enjoy it. I enjoy uh, acting and uh, working and collaborating with other people, having fun, enjoyment, as well as adding value, contributing, working together. I'm going to show you one little slide uh, that is in regards to how the same thing that we see in marketing with a funnel is also applicable within open source. And that couldn't be a helper maybe for you. Okay, so this is the traditional marketing funnel as we know it, meaning that there is a, a huge world of unknown people and they somehow find out about your uh, ideas, products, services, then uh, they become interested, uh, might be, become a prospect. Some of those leads to become a lead. And then there is an opportunity. And from the opportunity, uh, you get to get a customer. If you compare this with the open source funnel, it's almost the same. You see, like only four things are changing. So you first have an some is unknown about your product, your software, then they visit you and see, okay, this might be interesting. Let's take it for free. That's what we call the traditional leechers. And then they decide, hey, this is something I want uh, to be an active part of. So I register my user, I become a user. And with the help of the community, uh, users become involved. And when they inv get involved, then they start contribution, contributing. So that is something that was really growing and scaling up through my life. And uh, just recently, uh, about a month ago, after 16 years of being entrepreneur, I decided uh, to 
go and uh, apply for a job. Really, I applied for a job, yes. But it's a very special job. I'm going to be, I'm already uh, the community lead at uh, Rocket Chat. And um, in that, I'll have to combine the local uh, around the software community, find other communities to collaborate with, and in that train also take into account how this open source software is adapted and used within the corporate environment. This whole mix makes everything scale and everything grow. So what is RocketChat? RocketChat is a fully customizable communications platform for organizations with high standards on data sovereignty and data protection. It enables real-time conversations between colleagues with other companies, with your own customers and that is regardless on how they want to connect with you. RocketChat has grown in the last years be, be, and it's got to be uh, become beyond team chat. Uh, the chat you most likely know as uh, Microsoft Teams, Slack, MetaMost or similar communication tools. Each of them have channels where you can organize your conversations, you have threaded messages, and you can make specific team discussions. With the growth that uh, RocketChat uh, had in the past years, it got really closely entangled uh, with our open source community. And this community is very important because it is actually the motor of uh, growth, prosperity, ideation, and collaboration. And that allows our engineering team uh, to engage um, to engage with the community and uh, make the most beautiful and uh, great solutions and integrate it together. So that is a real great asset for not going beyond, but staying close to the source, staying close to the core and actually collaborating and being together more than the sum of its individual parts. So why is RocketChat important these days? I mean, go and make, it's not a poem, it's a story. It's about conversations. Conversations make us unique. They are the very thing that make humans human. They're how we connect, bond, exchange information and work better together. Unfortunately, the technology was meant, that was meant to bring us closer together, managed to set us apart. It focused on the benefit of a select few, rather than all of us and each and one, every one of us. It limits of what we can and cannot do. So in practical, there is, you're allowed to talk, as long as everyone uses the same tool and as long as you are okay to completely waive your rights to data privacy, security and ownership. Enough. That is not how you want to. These are our conversations. It's time to make things right. Time to focus on better, on the better good. We're meant to connect, bond, and work together with whoever we need on our terms. It is time to own our conversations, just like it always was meant to be. For about quite some time, there is next to this uh, team chat, there is also Omnichannel. And it has been integrated with, let's say, almost all chats. This is the way to communicate with almost every communication medium. So you can imagine, uh, for example, it's with uh, Telegram, Facebook, Messenger, WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, but also all protocols like SMS and email. Recently, uh, VoIP, Voice over IP was added and also the metrics protocol. They were added to the mix, allowing power users to seamlessly switch communication between all the contacts directly in their preferred device, 
omnichannel is about removing friction from your customers and allowing business to happen. Whether your customer prefers to commute communicate. It can be on a different device. It can be from a website with a little widget, a live chat widget, and it integrates and it's, it's a real beautiful flow. So the intent here is to let every conversation flow without compromise. You own your data and about to be able to customize anything and integrate with everything. Customizations, those are what we call in Rocket Chat in-app chat. That is a playground where all the different apps meet with a robust and real-time API. Together with the new UI kit, uh, this allows for developers and power users maybe as well uh, to do all kinds of magic things uh, with, still with the best of interoperability and security that you already used to uh, see in the RocketChat software. Some of this magic sums down, and I'll sum it up here, is about uh, authentication. It could be an LDAP connected to an Active Directory. It could be a SAML, OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, and many more. Uh, voice over IP, email connections, matrix, web address federation between different services. So that's your the users of your chat can also communicate with uh, friendly other services, their users. It has a robust uh, REST and real-time API that integrate with about anything. Still, the old and familiar web hooks are in place. So it's easy to connect bots, for example, with BotPress, RESA, and many more. And in inside those bots, you can use uh, artificial intelligence and natural language pr program uh, processing. Also, there's an app engine, and with the app engine, uh, it allows for making applications directly inside your, rec your Rocket Chat service, meaning that you can get specific functionality and use that within your chat. The UI kit allows for uh, user interface extensions and a new type of integration and interaction. And then on top of that, it's still interoperable. And that is something which is really important, interoperability and security. You currently see it uh, that many governments like uh, Swedish, German, Dutch, and other Western European countries, and with that more and more other countries around the world, value and make it the de facto standard that software is interoperable. It uses open standards and is able to communicate and not be tucked away in some place where it's only available and accessible after you sign your NDDA non-disclosure agreement and you actually pay. So I'm really happy that I can talk to you now and tell you a little bit about how my journey started, where I'm in now, and what is RocketChat, and how RocketChat can help you, and how you can help and integrate RocketChat. So I'm really looking forward uh, to talk to you all who see this uh, presentation, and uh, yeah, I wish you all a great OW2Con, and uh, hope to see and talk with you soon. Thank you. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation. In this talk, I will give you an overview of Telosis. What is it, how it works, and how you can use it to boost your project. First, what is Telosis? Telosis is a very light and simple tool written in Java. It is designed to generate any type of source code, and you can use it to boost your project. Bootstrapping is a typical use case for Telosis. Telosis was created to solve the problems usually encountered with code generation because very often code generators are heavy and complicated, difficult to set up and difficult to use. Many code generators behave like a black box. They produce code that does not correspond to expectations and it is difficult, sometimes impossible, to modify their behavior to obtain exactly what we want. 
Another point is that the tooling can also impose its own choices in the generated code. For example, some frameworks or code style or patterns and so on. So it can be very intrusive. The Telosys approach is different. Telosys is light, simple, and it is fully customizable by design. Indeed, you can customize not only the model, of course, but also the project configuration and above all, the templates. Templates customization is mandatory to be able to fit specific needs. It is thanks to this personalization that you can obtain exactly what you want. The Telosys key points uh, are the, the following points. Telosys is light, simple and easy to use. So you can uh, start using it very quickly and the learning curve is very short. Telosys is also uh, completely independent from any IDE. And if you want, you can use it with uh, just a simple and basic uh, text editor. Obviously, Telosys is free and Telosys is open source. There is no vendor lock-in. You can install it, use it, and uh, finally drop it if you want. It's not a long-term choice. You can uh, consider Telosys as a disposable tool. And last but not least, adaptability and flexibility are also very important points because they allow Telosys to be used in many use cases. So what about uh, Telosys flexibility? As mentioned previously, Telosys is able to generate any type of code. And uh, that requires a great adaptab adaptability and extensibility in order to be able to provide a solution for unexpected situation if needed. The principle is you decide, you make your own choices and Telosys adapts. Each project having its own needs regarding the design of the entities, Telosys provides extension capabilities at model level. It provides, provides more than uh, 50 standard annotations for all standard needs, but it also allows to enrich the design of the entities with a system of specific tags. The templates are also fully customizable. They are based on the Velocity Templating Engine, so it's quite easy to adapt the templates file. Another important point is to be able to manage composite primary keys. Although in general we try to avoid them, composite primary keys are sometimes an imposed constraint, for example for database partitioning or when using a legacy database. And composite primary keys are natively supported by Telosys since the beginning of the tool. So now let's look at the Telosys model. A model contains all the entities definition for the current project. In Telosys, a model is just a directory containing one dot entity file for each entity. An entity file is just a text file editable with any text editor. And an entity is described with a very simple grammar. Uh, this grammar is defined by the Telosys uh, domain specific language. Here is an example entity, and as you can see, an entity is composed of uh, attributes and links. Each attribute or link has a name and a type. The type is a neutral type. It means that this is a type independent from any programming language. It is used only to design the model, and it will be converted to the target language type at generation time. To enrich the design, you can use annotations. An annotation is a keyword starting by the at character. And uh, currently, there are more than 50 annotations. For example, at ID is used uh, to define uh, the entity identifier. Uh, that is uh, the primary key if you use a relational database. And for a composite primary key, you just have to set uh, at ID on several attributes. You can also use uh, at uh, default value to define the default value, at size to define the maximum size, uh, and so on. And to be able to adapt to all special cases, you can also use the tags. And the tag is a user-defined information. Uh, so you can use any word starting by the sharp character. And if necessary, a tag can contain a value enclosed in parentheses. And now I will show you an example of a, a model in a basic text editor. Okay, so this is my uh, Notepad++ editor, and I am here in a Telosys project with the Telosys tools 
directory containing the project configuration, the Telesys tools CFG. In this file, I can define the source folders where to generate uh, the code with uh, source, resources, web, etc. Can define the root package and uh, also a lot of uh, specific variables, for example, uh, the project name, project title, uh, Git repository, framework version, uh, etc. And here I have all the models, all the templates, and uh, in the models I have employees model, orders model, with the model description here, it's a YAML file, uh, catalog entity. That is an aggregate route mapped on the T catalog table, uh, category entity, and uh, for example, order entity uh, with the ID, the primary key. Uh, I have here a foreign key. Uh, this field is a foreign key pointing to the customer entity. And here, two links. Uh, the first link is uh, one too many with a collection of order items and uh, this link is a many to one link and now if I open the Telesis CLI tool I have here my two models I can select model orders I can list entities and if I want to check the model consistency I have the check model command and the model is okay, ready to use. Okay, so now we have a model. And the model is the declarative part for the generator. And this unique model can be used to generate any type of source code, for example, Java, PHP, Python, SQL scripts, uh, etc. And to do this, the generator requires templates. A template defines what we want to generate from the model and how it will be generated. It contains the processing part of the generation. The templates will be applied to the model entities to generate the expected code. Each template is specialized to generate a certain type of file. For example, we can create a set of templates to generate a persistence layer in Java, or another set of templates to generate a web application in Python. So now it's time to dive in the template files. Here is a piece of code extracted from a template file. And uh, as mentioned previously, Telosys uses Velocity as a template engine. So the language used in the template file is VTL. And VTL is a, is a Velocity template language. In this example, uh, the words in red are Velocity keywords, for example, uh, for each and end to iterate on all attributes. And the words in blue or Telosys objects coming from the model or from the project configuration. Velocity is a well-known product with good documentation, so it's easy to understand this kind of language and thus to create new templates or adapt existing templates. And the Velocity language has been enriched with uh, Velocity utility functions and objects in order to meet uh, certain uh, recurring needs. In a real project, after a while, you have to manage multiple templates to cover the different parts of the project. So, to facilitate the management of templates, they are organized in bundles. Usually, a bundle contains a set of templates dedicated to generate a specific part of the application. For example, you can have one bundle for the REST API and another bundle for the domain objects or for the persistence, or for the automated test, uh, and so on. Each bundle of templates is usually stored in a Git repository, and some examples of bundles are available on GitHub, and they can be installed automatically by Telosys. So now, to illustrate uh, the templates and the generation principle, let's see a real example. So, here we are still in uh, Notepad++ uh, editor, and this time we will dive in the templates folder. And in this folder, uh, we have one folder for each bundle. So I have here seven bundles, 
and uh, this set of bundles is designed to generate uh, Java application. So I have a bundle here to generate the Maven project structure, another one to generate plant UML uh, diagram. Uh, this is for the, for the, the domain, the persistence uh, with my batches, etc. So uh, let's have a look in the domain. And for example, here we have the template for generating a parent uh, Java class. And uh, we can see, for example, uh, if uh, condi condition here. Uh, set uh, variable initialization uh, for each. Uh, here, this portion of code is uh, Java comment uh, with the uh, author. Author here is a global variable defined in the project uh, configuration. We, are, we have here the name for the current entity, and uh, we can iterate uh, on each attribute defined for this entity. Uh, create uh, getters and setters uh, and so on. The bundles are designed to generate a Java application, so we are now in uh, IntelliJ with the basic uh, structure for the project, multimodule uh, Maven project. And as Telosys is a basic uh, CLI tool, we can use it directly in the IntelliJ terminal. So if I list my uh, bundle, I have different bundles available. I will select the domain bundle with some templates in it and I will generate Java classes for orders domain. I will use the generate command. Yes. And I have now 28 new files. And indeed, we have here a new tree with Java source code. And all the code generated is here. And for example, I have my order parent class with attributes, etc., in comments, uh, the composite primary key here, and whatever we want. Uh, now, I can select another bundle, for example, the persistence bundle with my batis. I will generate everything with yes. Okay, I have now new files in my batis with this time repository for persistence with mappers with SQL requests here. And now I will use the bundle Liquibase because Liquibase is used to manage the database and I will generate all the files. And now in resources, I have the main Liquibase file and here the first changelog with all create tables and all the constraints, for example, the foreign keys with an index for each foreign key. So now you have the choice. You can continue to write repetitive code manually with copy-paste burden and low productivity and a lot of risk regarding code quality, potential bugs, and with very often compliance deviations from standards. Or you can just let Telosys do it for you. Thank you for your attention. Hi, and thanks for joining this presentation about the evolution of knowledge in 2022. My name is Marco Cortella, and I'm a BI consultant and data visualization specialist for Knowledge Labs inside the engineering group. My main tasks are working with clients to successfully implement projects to extract valuable insights from their data. So in a few words, what is Knowledge? Knowledge is an ABI suite. That means it fully supports the BI requirements and the modern needs such as self-service and ad hoc reporting. 
Moreover, it offers mesh-up capabilities to combine data coming from different sources, high-level customization option to reach exactly the, that experience you want. Knowledge natively supports multi-device usage, allow you to get data from various data sources even at the same time, so you can use any data for the goal you have. It also follows open architecture that makes integration tasks easier, a subject that is important in Ember if you are looking for a product to, to embed in yours, as for an OEM solution. Knowledge is an open source suite not only because you can find the source code, but also because it adopts open standards and for sure you can guarantee the user thanks to facilities and support that you can have with the enterprise solution. It can work also on premises or on cloud for your data or service strategy. These are only a few snapshots to understand what we mean with analytics business intelligence suite. How we satisfy information distribution, data visualization, and analytical tasks. Basically, you can start from the traditional static reports that you can even produce in a batch way and send to users by email and move to a more modern and interactive capabilities like OLAP for multidimensional analysis and interactive dashboards that allow you to combine data coming from different sources in an interactive intuitive way. In addition, you have the QBE for visual data exploration and KPIs to measure your performances according to thresholds and alarms. Knowledge also supports spatial data, and more in general, with Data Mesh App, you can combine different technologies such as structured data on a hard BMS database, or maybe solar indexes and files. Users can have their own workspace to customize their environment build their own dashboards, explore their own data space, and upload private data for a full self-service capability. Moreover, you can embed custom code to build empowered analytics and advanced data visualizations for infographics or storytelling. Everything at the enterprise level with security, profiling, multi-tenant, metadata, and any kind of management features. More in detail, looking at the customization capabilities in an open architecture, you can plug your own HTML widget into the product. You can use your favorite charting library, and you can even plug your R or Python script for powerful data visualization. But using the R and Python code, you can also write custom functions to perform more analytical tasks, such as prediction, clustering, classification, text stackings, and so on. The advantage of plugging custom code into an enterprise solution instead of building a custom application is that aside from the full feature set it offers, it that, is that you can just plug your code for custom enhancement and behavior and you do that in a second environment where the data are ready, checked, profiled and linked to the orders. But now let's talk about some new feature introduced in the already released version 8.0. The gallery for custom widgets will let you save every custom widget you built in order to make them available to other users and for other dashboards. With the gallery, you can transform any custom code you write into a kind of template that you can use and use again. So, whenever you add a new widget in a dashboard, you can start with the right designer as you usually did for chart, table, etc or you choose an already built widget from the gallery and simply link the right data into it. In a similar way, the new function catalog collects your R and Python code, so you can write custom functions to perform more analytical tasks, such as prediction, clustering, classification, and so on. The function catalog allows your data scientist to write custom functions that can be easily used by any other users without R and Python skills. In this way, you can enhance every analysis with the advanced functions without having to involve the data, data scientist all the time. In the enterprise edition of Knowledge, both the gallery and the catalog 
come with a full set of already built widgets and functions. Like, for example, a full set of cards, sliders, or rich graphical widgets to choose from, and also ready to use function that you can use with your dataset to extract valuable information. And now let's see what's coming next in the 8th series of Knowledge. We are going to work on four main pillars. Data preparation, to enable data processing even in the self service pipeline. Augmented analytics, to embed intelligence into the suite, providing end user support and every data touch point. Building also a complete software service offering. And very important, a revamped UI to provide a better UX to make knowledge more user friendly. And also the dashboard engine will be completely rethinked and enriched to be more easy to use. We will continually work on each pillar through the year, but data preparation and the new UI have already been started last year. So, focusing on data preparation, we are close to release a first version of this new module, where we set up the architecture that here is based on Spark, the management of the transformation pipeline, and some first operations. Remember that here the goal will be enabling a certain degree of data manipulation in the self service process without ask for a traditional ATL process. In this way, when the end user will start uploading his own data or using a variable dataset, he can easily customize the data structure and contents without using external tools. And talking about general operations such as grouping, splitting, merging data, applying filters, updating contents, and range of classified data, transforming a continuous value into a discrete one, or masking private data, for example. And here you can see a video for the actual state of the art. So from, the, from his private workspace, every authorized user will be able to handle dataset and transform them as he needs. So opening the dataset with the data prep option, the user will get immediately a data preview and every time he can see the result of his operations. So for example, like splitting, merging columns, as you can see now, or maybe removing unnecessary columns and getting the result in real time. As I told you before, we are also rebuilding the UI interface of both the administration and user part in order to be more easy to use with a nicer look and feel. Another interesting feature we are working on is the team management that will let the administrator create new teams to customize the overall look and feel of knowledge directly from a user interface without having to write code. So some of these features will be available in the version 8.1 and we already released a release candidate version you can just download right now for free and test it. Of course, we are happy to hear your voice and get contribution from the community. So these are some helpful links that you can visit to participate and contribute to knowledge. If you don't want to miss us anything about the upcoming news regarding knowledge, you can subscribe to our newsletter and visit our webinars webpage where you can find the schedule of free webinars coming up. So thank you for the attention and feel free to contact us and ask anything about the product. Good morning, everyone. My name is Philippe Barey, and I'm an open source officer at the City of Paris. And I'm in charge of external relationships regarding the Lutest platform. For those who haven't heard of it before, I'll describe it in more details in a bit. I'm very happy to be presenting at this year's edition of the OW2Con and would like to deeply thank the OW2 team for having me today.
So my talk today is about the City of Paris's efforts to lower the technical blockers that may prevent or give a hard time to newcomers in the Lutes community. But first things first, what is Lutes? So I apologize in advance to the people who have been following our conferences for more than 15 years now and know Lutes as well as I do, but I'll wait, I'll be quick, I promise. So Lutes is the platform for digital services for cities and public administrations. It doesn't mean that other sectors cannot use it, of course, but that the projects were mainly led by cities' needs. It is a service engine that allows the assembling of technical components on an application core that already contains all the redundant functionalities for any sites, such as the front office and back office accesses, user management and access rights, plugin management or daemon configuration, etc. So this assembly, therefore, makes it possible to create customized websites to provide one or more services based on the same architecture and to provide access to the necessary configuration for its per proper use, as well as the collection of submitted data and the management of business functionalities. So in 2003, the City Council of Paris voted for the opening of Lutes's source code and this is how, in 20 years of existence, the Lutes core repos code, code repository has exceeded 500 available plugins plus the core project named the Lutes core, which is now in version 7.0.5. So version 7 has been available since, since the end of last year, and it is from the, here that people who already knew about Lutes are welcome to pay attention again. So uh, about the updates on Lutes v7, um, we can tell, uh, I've put a, a full list, um, but I'll try to be quick. Um, what's new in Lutes v7? Independence from CSS frameworks. Before Lutes 7, each version of the core was linked to a version of a CSS framework. Since Lutes 4, the core relied on Twitter's Bootstrap framework, which brings all the responsive design features to adapt to mobile consultations. Um, each major evolution of this framework included a complete break of compatibility with the previous versions. This resulted in having to modify all the HTML templates when Lutes's core was upgraded from the Bootstrap framework. So in Lutes v6, a set of macros of the free mark marker HTML template engine have been created to encapsulate the management of CSS classes, uh, depending on the version of Bootstrap. So this effort has been finalized in v7 so that the macros allow the creation of HTML template that are completely independent from the CSS framework. So to reach this result and validate it, v7 aimed at supporting at least three frameworks simultaneously bootstrap 3 for a compatibility with v6 plugins that do not use macros encapsulating css styles bootstrap 4 to support new features and bulma to demonstrate independence from bootstrap um, there's also been a, a new graphical look of the back office so now um, the possible independence of the CSS framework allows us to choose a look and feel based on the very trendy material design charter launched by the Google or uh, for Android uh, and then Angular. Um, upward compatibility was a major concern in the design of Lutes v7. Some free marker macros were and Java classes have been removed to clean up obsolete functions, but alerts are generated by sonar analysis in order to evaluate any corrections that need to be made to be fully compatible with V7. So beyond that, V7 offers a compat compatibility mode based on Bootstrap 3, which keeps the deleted macros in the standard version in order to run a V6 plugin in Lutas V7. Then the layout of the technical settings in the back office have been completely redesigned 
to bring all these functions together in a single menu. This has allowed to reduce the number of functions appearing here and there in the back office menus. Um, then new functions allow bookmarks to be valued from environment variables. The first application is for setting up the db.properties file in which the database ser server, the database and connections uh, information can be defined based on, a on environment variables. The method takes into account the content of the file. So this feature is useful to manage Docker uh, secrets also. Um, new trace uh, functionalities are proposed by V7. Uh, there are intended, uh, they are, sorry, intended for application uh, that wish to set up a history of certain sensitive actions for security audit purposes. Then uh, the, compatibility, the compilation uh, version of Lutes v7 remains Java 8. However, the, compila the compilation is possible in Java 11, thanks to the addition of the dependencies removed in the versions after JDK 8. Um, the management of resources, uh, access controls, uh, extended to the front office, are back the rule-based access control. Uh, the rule management has been extended to back office users. So this will, um, very, this will allow very precise management of access rights to resources, and particularly in the context of workflows. These mechanisms can also be implemented for daemons or REST web services. And finally, last but not least, the plugin wizard and code wizard, code generators, updated the plugin wizard, uh, the, which is the generation of, the, of a complete plugin, and code wizard, which is the generation of unit files. Um, these code generators now produce code for V7, uh, and in particular, HTML templates using the new macros. Um, here it is, the community updates. We've had recently new members who have joined the Lutes community during the past year. And thanks to many of them, we have been able to take the time to make a kind of introspection on the state of the Lutes community of users and contributors. The result is fair, but still mixed as to the number of known users. It is obviously necessary to realize that it is complicated by proposing open and publicly accessible code to know who implemented it, how, in which context, etc., which makes communication and management of the community a bit tricky. So we decided to implement several major actions. The first one is to allow easy contact with the development team through a single point of contact to ask for information, demonstration, support, etc. The second is to establish an interface to contact users and notify them of important information such as detecting flaws, available patches, and major releases. So this may sound simple and obvious, but it's a bond we've struggled to establish with our users for years. We will also soon be holding regular community cafes to bring people together and get them on board with the project, um, highlight less known features and share best practices, and even discuss about the roadmap. We feel that this lack of communication has prevented some contributions in the past. Finally, we, are we realized how difficult it was for some newcomers to discover the catalog, to go through the list of available plugins in an alph alphabetical sorted list, trying to figure out whether or not they should add them as a dependency to their project. And that was just the beginning of the difficulty in finding compatible versions. I think this was experienced by many of us on our own projects. And it has, it was this authorization that was the most brutal. This was a realization that the Lutes platform should have its own software suite 
composed of pre-assembled business packs, of which we, as the main contributor, guarantee the list of plugins and their functionalities, their features, as well as the versions used that are compatible as we run them in the city of Paris. So in a tested and proven live context. This is already done for some of them. So it was very simple. And this helps it'll save a lot of time. So it is with great pleasure today that I have the privilege to share with you for the first time publicly the launch of Cité Libre. Cité Libre is the name of the suite of packaged digital solutions, offerings that can be easily white labeled and reused as is. These packages allow for easier deployment and more natural adoption. This is currently composed of two solutions already industrialized internally, the online uh, appointment management system and the forms generator. So for those who don't know, appointment is a, a tool that allows you to set up agendas for appointments with features such as mapping to display the availability on a map or connections to queuing tools, um, management of overbookings or um, sending out automated um, reminders as well uh, by either mail, SMS, uh, you name them. Um, forms. Uh, this tool allows you to easily configure a form for all your dematerialized administrative procedures. Um, advanced features such as displaying condition fields, um, multi-step filling, drive, draft saving makes it like a fully customizable tool in real time. The back office also allows you to define a workflow to assign requests to the, the, the corresponding teams until they are fully processed and notified back to the user. So packaged solutions doesn't mean we cannot extend them, of course. It only guarantees an easier way to share for a quick deployment. So as far as the user uses the standards of the solutions, there's no need to code. But if one wants to add a feature or update an existing one, then one just needs to open up the hood, see what's inside, find out about Lutes, and only focus on the single development. So about the roadmap of Cité Libre. Um, first step is make all resources available, such as the demo websites and different packages like a POM, WAR, zip files, or even Docker images that could be ready to run and turn on. Um, we also would like to add existing projects. So uh, a few of them are soon to be included, like Don Maru, uh, the non-emergency reporting system, um, the participatory budgeting solution, and new projects such as Act and Decide that are part of a participatory citizenship tendency at the city of Paris. We also would like to provide with combinations of packs for those who want to combine many business applications on the same web app. Then it's time to communicate, reach out to cities and administrations to grow our communities of users. So this is the beginning of the new journey for Lutes, as you can tell. Thank you all very much for your attention. I really hope this presentation has helped you understand better the service side of Flutes rather than the technical and the what's been running for the past 20 years. Long live to Cité Libre. Thank you. Hi. My name is Gilles and I'm the head developer at FactorFX. Uh, my role is to manage the life cycle of the OCS inventory project. Uh, today I'm going to uh, present you uh, the main feature uh, to give you some insight on the project history 
the open source community we build, uh, the architecture and the feature of uh, OCS inventory. So today we will go through the project history, we will present you the open source community, uh, we will give you some technical information about the architecture and the feature OCS provide. So the first version of OCS inventory was published in 2000. It was uh, basically a C++ port of a VB application that was named uh, Stills Inventory. The information were, was stored in a Microsoft Access uh, database and uh, to consult that data you obviously needed to have a Windows machine. Uh, in 2002, uh, OCS Inventory version 2 came out with a first implementation of the CSV format support and a new web interface that uh, was coded in ASP.NET. In 2004, the OCS Inventory version 3 came out uh, with the first revision of the WMI support on Windows and the database model was uh, on MySQL. In 2005, the first big version of the project, so the OCS Inventory Next Generation 1.0 uh, came out with Perl and Apache implementation, XML-based format for the communication of the agent. It came out with a Linux agent and it was the first truly open cross-platform release. Uh, the web interface was uh, PHP-based, so you could install it on any operating system. In 2010, the second major version of OCS Inventory came out with the 2.0. It was the first revision to implement the network device inventory using the SNMP protocol. There was a live data filtering to improve the inventory quality and um, have a better management of the software and the hardware inventory of the machine. There was also the first uh, LDAP a CAS and uh, single sign-on connection. The web interface was also rewritten. By the end of 2010, uh, we released the 2.1 of OCS Inventory, featuring a new installation page uh, that was meant to have an easier installation method. Uh, we greatly improved the OCS deployment uh, system and we released the first revision of the macOS agent. This macOS agent was based on the, on the Linux agent we previously developed. In 2016, the 2.2 of OCS uh, went available. The major feature was a rework of the old UI. This version went also with uh, a bootstrap library and was semi-responsive. We provided uh, a lot of improvement also in, plugin, in the plugin engine. In uh, 2017, the 2.4 came out with the first revision of the REST API module we worked a lot on the customization of the table system to provide a customizable reporting uh, inside the software and uh, a system to provide proxy for the deployment. Uh, in 2018, the 2.5 of OCS Inventory came out with a full rework of the multi-criteria page which is a page that allows you to create reporting and criteria based on full data model of OCS inventory. We also developed uh, a software and asset categorization in order to group your machines uh, depending on the software and hardware specification they have. In 2019, the 2.6 uh, was released with a full rework of the plugin engine and the rework of login dashboard. The goal of these two modifications were to provide an extensive system on OCS in order to improve the way you can extend the inventory and, and the reporting of the software. The login dashboard has also been reworked with a better uh, insight of what is currently going on in your, on your assets the number of software that are installed, all this kind of thing. There was also the first revision of the Docker image. So we provided uh, the first implementation of our software using Docker and also the first repository of the Debian and RPM came out. In 2020, the 2.7 version of OCS uh, has been released with 
one of the first major features, uh, the first revision of the CVE inventory. So using the software uh, database, we have the possibility to tell you which software might have a vulnerability inside it. We also added the web application inventory and uh, the MySQL over SSL implementation. Uh, in 2022, uh, the 2.9 of OCS inventory has been released with the introduction of what we call the deployment wizard. The goal of this feature is to uh, provide an easier way to deploy software, uh, command and uh, files on the remote systems. OCS inventory is uh, an open source software that comes in the GPL v2 license. Uh, all the sources uh, of the project are available on GitHub. We are proud to have uh, a growing community and a lot of contributors that participate to the life of the software. Uh, we provide also a dedicated platform for the community to publish their, their plugins. We are also on the social media and especially on Twitter. It's been a few years that we are uh, recommended by the French government and we have been registered to their uh, recommended free software uh, database. So why should you use or install OCS in your company? Uh, OCS has uh, a lot of advantages. The, the first one will be to give you uh, crystal clear information of what's inside uh, your assets. So the hardware and the software composition uh, of all the operating systems, so it can be computers, uh, servers, and uh, network devices. You also have the possibility to control and to fix uh, your configuration issue. So using the inventory information, you will be able to uh, control if the configuration of your assets are the right one. And if they are not, you have the possibility to uh, deploy and fix the configuration it, there is also an inventory of uh, the connected peripheral on all your uh, machines. So the deployment software allows you to manage the software version and update directly from the web interface. So if you, are, if you want to perform a, a mass upgrade of one specific software in your company, you can do everything from a, a centralized way. That brings us to the, to the reporting uh, of the software that is centralized. So you see all the information of your assets from uh, one web page. So OCS features uh, a lot of different functionalities in order to help you manage the lifecycle of all your assets. OCS will be able to scan your computer and server to have a basic and detailed inventory of uh, the hardware composition, software's inventory, and depending on the operating system, you can have specific features such as repository uh, inventory inside uh, Linux and registry inventory for Windows. OCS also brings a network scanning capability, so with the IP discovery that will give you the list of all the IP addresses that are being used on your network and uh, the SNMP scanning to have more detailed information about the network devices. Uh, it can be, for example, uh, the firmware version of your switches, uh, routers, or it can also uh, be the information for you uh, company printers. We provide a secure software deployment system that allows you to install, update, uh, perform remote command execution directly on a specified group of machine. There is also the capacity to store file uh, on the remote system directly from the web console. We also provide some advanced features uh, in, in the case inventory is not the only goal. We have a lot of uh, different improvement on the software inventory that allow you to group machine and uh, have more detailed inventories. Uh, the first one will be to perform web application inventory so you can uh, see how many people uh, are using a specific web application in order to see if an application is reused and by how many people it is used. 
The software categorization brings the possibility to group software into categories and perform reporting depending on the category the software is inside. We also provide a way to get vulnerabilities on the installed software on the machine. That's what we call the CVE inventory. We base our reporting on CVE meet and exploit database. We also bring a hypervisor inventory. Uh, so in the case you want to inventory the, the hypervisor configuration, the VM and all the, the, the information that will be present on the hypervisor. We provide plugin for vSphere, uh, Hyper-V, Nutanix, Azure, and Amazon Web Services. Uh, since the 2.6, we will provide uh, what we call the extension engine, which provides the possibility to extend the inventory, uh, the machine inventory, without having uh, to change the, the code of the product. Uh, here is some example of the existing plugin that can be uh, installed. Uh, for example, we have the schedule task, the firewall rules, uh, the list of the Windows services, and the Microsoft Office uh, keys inventory. We also have the possibility to inventory, uh, to perform a more detailed inventory of external tools, such as Oracle database, SQL server instances, the browser extensions and TeamViewer and Edidesk uh, inventory. The extension engine also allows you to create your own reporting in the case you are not satisfied with the basic one uh, present of the software and you are able to create uh, your own uh, graph, uh, tables, etc. Uh, OCS inventory is able to connect through plugin uh, on uh, several different uh, CMDB software such as uh, GLPI, ITOP, CMD Build, and ITSMNG. OCS inventory architecture uh, comes as follows it can be installed in a different uh, separated uh, server or as an all in one infrastructure. The first one will be the database server, which is based on MySQL or MariaDB. You have the administration console uh, that comes with uh, the PHP web interface. The, de the deployment server that can be pretty much any HTTPS uh, server. And the communication server that runs on Perl and ModPerl that will manage the, uh, the inventory of uh, the agents. One uh, main advantage of this architecture is that OCS is using a really basic protocol and doesn't need any uh, port opening or port forwarding on the firewalls or rotors. So here is a, a summary of what we speak about in the last uh, slide. So the agents are using a really different technology depending on the operating system uh, because we try to be as close as the system uh, to have a limited fin fingerprint on the system. Uh, Windows, uh, Windows Agent is developed using C++ MFC language and we are using Visual C++ uh, 15 to compile the agent. Unix Agent is uh, a Perl implementation that will perform all the command and the inventory process. The Unix agent is uh, what we call the Unix Unified Agent that is compatible with Linux, AX, Solaris, uh, BSD-based system, and it's also the bring the implementation for the macOS agent. macOS agent is basically a specific branch of the Unix agent. The Android agent itself is uh, is a Java uh, development on Android Studio. Uh, as a conclusion, I would like to thank you, the community and the contributors of the, of the project that uh, made everything possible and that make the software live. We also work with a few companies that uh, really help OCS growing, uh, such as uh, Murata, uh, Thales, uh, la Gendarmerie Nationale and uh, the European Commission. Thanks for your time and have a nice OW2 uh, conference. Hello everyone, welcome to the presentation of what's new in XWiki. 
So last year I've presented um, what was new uh, for the version up to XWiki uh, 13.4. So I'm now starting where I left last year, starting with 13.5 until the last release version of XWiki, which is 14.3 this year in 2022. Um, so the let's let's dive quickly in the release cycle of XWiki. So we release uh, about 12 releases. Um, of main releases of XWiki every year, one every month, and that leads to an LTS. And then we also release bug fix releases, and that's uh, that's why in total we release more than 30 uh, releases per year of XWiki. So if you see, uh, uh, 14.3 has been released end of April, and the uh, the previous one was at the end of March. So we're going to go through the, what was new in about uh, a year of work. So XWiki, uh, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a wiki, uh, it's an enterprise wiki, it's an advanced wiki, and um, and this is the homepage of what you get if you download XWiki. Uh, if you download XWiki 14.3, but it's, it was the same last year. Actually, we didn't change the homepage, and that's a good thing, because we try to make it as, as simple as possible. So even though we're adding features, we try to keep the UI as light as possible. And okay, so let's let's see what's the the first uh, the first new feature we have developed, and that's a consistent image styling. So that was a, a, a big request. Uh, if you have a wiki, you are an admin of a wiki, and you've got your users uh, inserting images, and they, everyone is using a different style. So some are using large images, others are using small ones, uh, some are using borders, etc. So that was not very consistent. So we introduced the ability for administrators to define image styles in the UI. And basically that means you can define anything that you can express in CSS and give it a, a name. And then uh, when you use the, um, the WYSIWYG editor, uh, which we've also redesigned completely, uh, and then you can select an image to insert and an image style, as you can see on the screenshot here. So that's cool because uh, it pushes users to choose uh, image styles that are defined by the admin. Uh, of course, if you go to the advanced tab that you can see on, on the screenshot, uh, you can override that. Uh, and that depends on the style you've chosen. So some styles allow overriding, others don't. Uh, that's the choice of the admin to decide uh, if that's allowed or not. Let's move on. Uh, so second change is image caption. Uh, so while we've redesigned the WYSIWYG editors, we've also added the support for captions image caption. As you can see, there is a little checkbox that you can check. And if you do that, when the image is inserted, then you have the ability to type the caption in the WYSIWYG editor directly. And you can put wiki syntax uh, in there also. So the next uh, change is the uh, ability to view images. Since we've defined these styles, uh, so you can use, for example, a, a, a thumbnail style, and you can insert a lot of images in your wiki, but it would be good if you were able to see the image in full screen. So that's what we did. Uh, now, when you, when you enable the, the lightbox feature, um, I think it's enabled by default now, but if not, then you can enable it. Uh, then when you over uh, or click on an image, then you can view it in full screen using a lightbox. And there you have a few options. Uh, like you can cycle through all the images of the page, you can uh, download the image, you can get a link to the image if you want to, to give that to someone else, and then they would go directly to the image um, in the browser, etc. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool and pretty nice. Um, next one, uh, next feature is actually the ability to rename attachments. So in next wiki, we've had the feature of being able to rename documents uh, for, for a very long time now. Uh, and that, that does a refactoring, if you rename the document, it does a refactoring where all links pointing to the document being renamed are also, also modified so that they're not broken. Uh, so that's nice, but we didn't have this for attachments. So it's now possible to rename attachments and also uh, to perform the refactoring of having all the pages that have links to these attachments also be updated to reflect the new uh, name or location of the attachment. So that makes it now consistent across uh, all the things that you can rename. So the next one is a big, uh, is a big change and a big positive change. Uh, it's the uh, we've developed a new PDF export. So far, we were using 
a server-side PDF export. We were using Apache FOP, FOP, and that was good, but it had some drawbacks. The main drawback is that there are some macros or, or pages that render content in JavaScript. For example, uh, as shown on the screen here, there's a chart.js macro uh, that displays graphs, uh, but on the, server, on the client side, sorry, using JavaScript. So that was not exported through the server-side PDF export that we had. So we've, we've created a new one client side, and the main issue with this is that there are some W3C specifications for that, but browsers don't implement them properly. Uh, so we've used a library called PageJS, which allows to provide polyfills for the uh, browsers that don't implement it yet. And that is working quite well. So this is still experimental, but we, we, we're working on it. And the next step is actually to be able to do this PDF generation in a Docker container. Uh, why? Because right now, what you get, the PDF export you get, would depend on the browser and the version of the browser that you use. So different users of the wiki may get some slightly different uh, PDF depending on, on the browser they use. So to solve this, uh, we can uh, do that in a, in a Docker container using, for example, a Chrome headless instance, and then uh, get that uh, PDF to the, to, the, uh, to the user. So that in that manner, everyone would get the same, the same PDF. So the next, uh, this next change is, is quite an important one. Uh, not everyone would need, will need it, but it's the ability to replicate content between different instances of XWiki. Imagine you've got a large instance of XWiki, uh, or rather a large setup of XWiki where you've got several instances across the world in different countries, and you want the ability of someone in one country to make changes and then that this change be replicated to another instance in another country. You may want to do this for several reasons. Um, one of them could be like you want to have the instance being uh, uh, co-located for better performance um, or, or other reasons like export control or, or other things. Uh, so this is now possible through this replication extension. So you'd configure which, which space or which nested pages are to be replicated. And uh, it uses uh, events and, um, and queues and caches and, uh, and, would, and will do the replication across the various instances. You can decide, you can fine tune exactly what you want to, to replicate, basically. So that's quite nice. So the next, uh, the next one is a very, very interesting feature in my opinion. Uh, it's something that's been popularized by GitHub. It's, uh, it's the equivalent of the GitHub pull request. We call it a change request. So basically, um, there are various limitations for people to contribute on a wiki. One of them is that people fear that they are going to break something or to enter something that is not correct, and this prevents them from contributing to wiki pages. So if you install this extension, then users will have, as you can see on the screen, they will have several buttons. There is the, the standard save and view one, and there's a new one say, called uh, save as change request. So if, if you use this one, then your changes are going to be um, save as change request, and then uh, there are approvers who can view the difference, um, provide uh, comments, run so reviews, and approve or not the change request to be applied. Uh, it's also interesting if, for example, you want to control more your wiki. Like, imagine it's a very important wiki, like a, a wiki uh, related to some law, some law text about the law, and you know this you cannot uh, you cannot have something that is not correct there. So you would want, for example, that every change goes through a change request so that other people. Uh, perform a review of the change before planning it. So it's now it's now possible. So I've, I'm showing you three three screenshots of how you, when you create a change request. So the first one is, is step number two here is you type a title, and then step number three you've got the the view the activity view of the change request with different tabs, description, the file changes, reviews, etc. And if you go on the file changes, then you have the list of all the 
file type in Godify in this in this uh, change request. It can be uh, addition, uh, it could be addition of files, it could be removal of, I, mean, I say files, but I mean pages. It could be um, deletion of pages, etc. As you can see, you can comment in line uh, on the different changes. So that's 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 pretty cool. Uh, the next one was also a very requested feature about being able to number various type of contents and especially headings. So we had some extensions, but they were, let's say, not perfect. And this was redone in a, in a much better way. So you've got now full control of what is the hierarchy of pages that you want to to be um, numbered for headings, for example. Uh, so in the information tab at the bottom of pages, you can activate heading numbering, as is shown in, in red here. Or you can dis disable it. And when you enable it, then you've got what is shown on the right with the uh, numbered headings. And uh, if you edit the page, then you, you also see the numbered headings directly in addition in the WYSIWYG editor. Uh, you can uh, press the tab or untab to actually move the, the numbering up or down uh, automatically. There are various other options, like you can skip numbering if you want, so you right click and then you've got a, 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 a menu which allows you to, to skip the numbering or to start it at a given number, for example. And, and that's, that's not just for headings, but it's also for figures, uh, as is shown here. Um, you can see figure one, figure two, and then, uh, so this is numbered, but you can also reference them. There's, there's a reference macro that you can use, and then automatically it would put the right number uh, to, for the figure. Last but not least, uh, we've also introduced uh, a feature called paragraph numbering, which allows to number paragraphs. So it's a bit of special case. Uh, and in, in, uh, in the stakeholders need of this feature here, it was the need to have some kind of, of rules um, about the, so pages in the wiki containing rules or, or design documents or low text. And this is quite interesting. In that case, each paragraph has a number and you can have sub paragraph with sub numbers, etc. So it's nice to be, uh, to be able to reference at the level of a paragraph. So that's now a, a new feature too. So we're now reaching uh, a new change number nine and that's security. It's not really a new change, but I wanted to highlight it because we've worked very actively, actively on security this year. Uh, last year, we introduced a uh, new security pop policy with the publishing of official publishing of CVEs. So we've continued this year. Uh, we've published uh, 21 CVEs uh, so far in 21 and 22. And for the time span we're talking about between 13.x and 14.x, there were 28 security issues reported and we fixed 21. So there are seven still open that we're working on. Uh, but this is to show that we, we are, we are quite active and taking this very seriously, uh, which is a, a good thing to do. Last but not least, uh, this is about the other features. So in total, we have uh, a lot of things like 839 issues uh, logged in our issue tracker. Uh, we containing other features, other improvements, bug fix, etc. There's, there's a lot of stuff, but there's no time to discuss all of them now, so you can look into the release notes if you want more, more information. And then there are things that are planned for 14.x uh, for till the end of the year and next year. Uh, a lot of usability work, and then I'm not going to discuss all of them, but things like um, multi-wiki refactoring, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and real-time editors, we have, that, we have had those for a while, but we want to continue making them even more production ready and, and enabled by default when they work, when we consider that they are work well enough. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the new changes of XWiki uh, that we've made for the, the past year. And if you have other ideas, then uh, we, they would be very welcome. Don't hesitate to, to contact us on the forum, uh, forum.xwiki.org or on our Jira, jira.xwiki.org. And we would, uh, we would love to have a discussion about those. So enjoy XWiki and have a good day. Thank you. Hi, welcome to this talk. 
I'm David Bouchier. I've been working at Centurion for five years as a C++ lead developer. This talk contains several cases of dependency issues we had to correct at Centurion, but also in various open source projects where I was involved. Here's the summary. We'll start with a brief introduction to dependencies between different software components. Then we'll talk about the types of dependency problems we have encountered and solved. And finally, the solutions should lead us to a more general solution. This will be our conclusion. In a nutshell, Centurion is a French software company created in 2005 as an open source monitoring player. Over the years, we added commercial products on top of our open source foundation in 2015 and grew to a $10 million and 100 employees international company with operations in France, UK, North America, and Benelux. Here is a non-exhaustive list of the tools we use. If you master one or more of these tools, we are hiring. Looking at a drawing like this one, you want to laugh, surely, because you can't imagine such a situation, it seems so stupid. Or you have already lived this situation and maybe you're still living it. Be careful not to just imagine a weak dependency as an isolated project maintained by one person. There are many cases of weak dependencies and that's kind of what we'll talk about in the rest of this talk. The first dependency issue we're going to talk about is governance. If the provider of a dependency decides to stop it, you are at their mercy. Historically, Centurion provided packages for CentOS. When CentOS 8 arrived, it was logical to build new packages for it. Then Red Hat announced the end of CentOS 8 for December 2021. CentOS 7 was not impacted. It is a long-term version and it will end in June 2024. What to do? Install our product on CentOS 7 while CentOS 8 exists, or install our project on a CentOS 8 when a few months this version will not be supported anymore. No good solution, but uh, CentOS 7 seemed to be the safest. It was urgent to find a really good one. After such news, it was obvious that we had to replace CentOS 8. We had two solutions. Find a distribution close to CentOS, redo our packaging for a recognized and stable distribution like Debian. The first solution seemed easier. The second was interesting, but more complicated. Since CentOS is used by many people, we weren't the only ones affected. Thanks to this big community of users, new Linux distributions like Alma Linux or Rocky Linux were born. As a result, we have been able to take advantage of these new features and we now provide RPM packages that are compatible with more distributions. The Debian solution was our favorite, but the migration is much more expensive. The packaging system, the dependencies names, the dependencies versions change, and this causes many impacts. After a significant amount of work, we are at the end of this migration. We were dependent on one distribution and we become compatible with many more. A very important point here is time. 
We often underestimate this factor. That's a big mistake. When you are told that the distribution will be stopped, and that's the same for a software or a library, they still continue to provide it for a moment. For example, one year. But hurry up. They don't give you that much time because they aren't sure yet. They give you time because they know it has an impact. After the news of the CentOS 8 discontinuation, we at Centrion, as I said, have been working on new distributions. A team was working directly on this, but our CI was still building CentOS 8 packages. And when the CentOS 8 servers went down completely, our CI didn't work anymore. We had to fix it. Even though it was almost done, such a thing is never a pleasure when done in a hurry. Here is another case of a problematic dependency, licenses. You work on a software that depends on a library, the latter is very important, and suddenly its developers decide to change the license. The chosen license is incompatible with your software license. There are many cases like this one. For example, we can find the MySQL GDBC product driver the developers of open source solutions could not deliver the driver to access the MySQL database and had to explain to users how to get the driver. Another example, surely more known, is the proprietary NVIDIA driver needed for long years by people if they want 3D acceleration, but never provided by open source Linux distributions. And we had to download it, then configure it before we got the long-awaited acceleration. We have several solutions. The first solution is not the best one, but can be the faster to implement. It consists in delivering an incomplete load software, and during the installation, you provide a way to download or install the necessary library. We just talked about it with the two previous examples. The second solution is to choose another library. If the one currently used is not very popular, this is a very good opportunity to change it. In the end, your application will be better. Forking can also be a solution. If the library has a large community of users, you won't be alone, and surely some of them will start to fork before you think about it. With modern languages, the use of de dependencies is more and more frequent. And here is a very impressive example. If you open the node modules folder in a node project, you can also be impressed by its size. In fact, you need dependencies that need dependencies that need dependencies, etc. That's what we call chains of dependencies. To understand the risk with chains of dependencies, we have this true story. On March 22nd, 2016, the owner of the little package left pad removed it from NPM. The package is not big, just a small code for formatting text. But the issue was that thousands of other NPM packages were using leftpad as a sub-dependency. So when JavaScript developers wanted to install their node modules, it didn't work. The tree is a good image of this notion of chain of dependencies. In this situation, we import the dependency that we directly need. We don't really care what their dependencies are. And in the end, if we look at all the imported libraries, there are many. We try to pick the ones we need and we trust them to make the right choices 
about their dependencies. To simplify our choice of dependencies, it's good to ask ourselves a few questions. Which dependencies are really necessary? If some of them are not necessary, let's delete them. Do you still use them? Another recurring question, we already talked about this. Is this dependency used by others? Which version are you using? The one that compiles on your OS and is 10 years old? Or the latest stable version? Is this dependency updated regularly? Does this dependency have security vulnerabilities? And if yes, are they fixed quickly? In the open source world, we use external repositories like sourceforge.net, github.com, gitlab.com, whatever. We also use software registries like npm, pip, cpan, conan, whatever. And to optimize our accesses, sometimes we use specific servers to host our dependencies. And what if one of them closes? At Centurion, to speed up the compilation of our C++ projects, we used Bintray.com to host our dependencies. It was very easy to use. When we needed a new dependency, we would create our Conan file, build the project, and push it to Bintray. So why Bintray? Because we were the owner of the repository. We could use any version we wanted. It was free. Our CI would download them and compile our projects before generating our packages. Then, Bintray closed. Of course, we had been warned, but we had other things to do, other emergencies. A fix had to be released before this migration. Too late. It was impossible to make the release before the big replacement of Bintray. Our solution was to switch from bintray.com to conan.io. Conan.io hosts many open source libraries already packaged. You just have to choose them when needed, but you don't have control of the version. We also changed our CI to keep a local copy of these dependencies to be able to compile even if the conan.io server is down. To achieve this, the changes were important. The versions of the dependencies on Conan.io are much newer than ours. We are using these versions because we are using the native C++ compiler of CentOS 7. After the update, we also had to update the development tool chain. The problems continue with our projects not compiling anymore which we had to fix. To validate these changes, unit and functional tests were added. When everything was working locally, we had to adapt the changes to the CI, which again took time. The good news is that uh, it worked. We came out with a better CI, less obsolete dependencies, and a brand new C++ compiler. After these examples, we can say, don't choose your software dependencies lightly. Don't. Never. Why doing this? If you have a dependency issue, there is always a solution. This is the power of the open source community. And often, if an issue takes a long time to fix, it is surely because your project already had legacy problems that should have been fixed earlier. I hope the subject has interested you. Thank you. Hello, 
My name is Ralf Soika. I want to talk today about how to digitize your business processes within your organization. I am the development lead of IMIX Workflow, founded by the company IMIX Software Solutions, located in Munich in Germany. IMIX Software Solutions is a 100% open source company focusing on workflow management solutions. We have built our own open source workflow engine started in 2005 and we are constantly improving this engine over years by adapting the latest technologies and industry standards. But what do I mean if I am talking about workflow engines? If you today search with Google for the topic workflow engine, you will see more than 80 million results. You will find workflow engines for nearly every technical aspect in the modern IT. For example, there's a huge number of workflow engines designed for Kubernetes, which is a cloud management platform. This kind of technical workflow engines are focusing on specific technical problems within a certain environment. Other workflow engines, for example, are designed to make software development more easy. There are various workflow engines and rule engines in the market that make it easier to build applications and adapt business rules and custom workflows. This way to use a workflow engine is also known as model-driven development, which is often based on BPMN, which is a common standard in workflow management. But what makes IMIX workflow different? IMIX workflow is a so-called human-centric workflow engine. The focus of this kind of workflow engines is about to support task management, collaboration and coordination of business processes within an organization. This involves the creation of tasks, their distribution, notifications, securing information and at least documentation of human tasks in accordance with organizational, contractual or legal regulations. A human-centric workflow engine is about to simplify the way people work together. In that way, IMIX workflow allows you to model your business process based on BPMN. This includes the creation, processing and delegation of tasks according to the compliance rules within your organization. An IMIX workflow automatically monitors and documents execution and helps people to get done tasks much faster. IMIX Workflow is open source and based on the BPMN 2.0 standard. BPMN stands for Business Process Modeling and Notation, which is the common standard to describe a business process. BPMN was initially designed to describe a business process without all the technical details of a software system. As a result, a BPMN diagram is easy to understand by all project members and a good starting point to talk about a business process with technical as also with management people. With the modeling approach from IMIX workflow, you can design every aspect of your business process, from task management to messaging, as also form design escalation up to complex business rules. This means you control your business process by the model and not by coding. So, now let's start the demo. The open source project IMIX Workflow splits into two solution areas. The IMIX Workflow Engine builds a technical core. It is a BPMN workflow engine providing the technical aspects of human-centric workflow engines. And IMIX Office Workflow is an integrated workflow management suite on top of this technology. It's a web-based application which can be used to introduce business processes within any organization. I will demonstrate you now IMIX Office Workflow, which gives you a good impression what you can do with this technology. Also, this software is of course 100% open source. So, let's switch to the demo. As you can see, this is a web application which I start in my browser. I can also access the application from any mobile device. When I log in, I see the typical dashboard of a workflow management, workflow management suite. On the right hand, I have my task list. Here I will see all open tasks where I have to work on. For example, I have to approve something or I have to give some information to somebody. In the middle, I have my requests, which means I can monitor things I have initiated or I want uh, to look into 
request with special interest for me. And on the right side, I have a list of business processes and workflows. And this list on the right side is defined by the workflow models created with BPMN standard. So you can extend this list at every time. So we will make an example of a purchase management. I will start a purchase requisition, which means this is an internal ordering process when I want to order, for example, a notebook or something like that. I click on the link and now the workflow engine opens a form with some information and some input forms. On the top I see an information area which is also defined by the BPMN model which guides me through the process. And then we have several input fields. So let's uh, say we want a new notebook. For example, from some company, I can type in some order number. We have a date picker here. I can choose a department that I am working on. And can type here some additional information. This is just an example how a form can look. On the right side, I have workflow actions and documents. This means I can add a document here. Um, which gives additional information. In this case, this could be an offer from the service provider where I want to order something. And then I can click on forward to send out my request. Now the workflow engine is taking over this request, looks into the workflow model and notifies automatically the next participants in the process. Though I can see my request is now in a factory review by two colleagues. Let's see what's happened when I switch my user ID. So I log out and choose another account. Though so here again, I am a new user. I have a, other, a different task list and some more requests here. And of course we see there's a new request with the, new, with the notebook uh, purchase order which I created before. I can click on this and of course I see the information from the purchase order with the document. But there's a different. Some input fields here are now locked. This is defined by the workflow model as you want to avoid in some cases that input data can be changed in a later phase in the process. Though this is a way you can control how information is entered or controlled. On the right side I have different workflow actions because I can now release the request or reject it. Let's say that's fine. And I click on release. Now the workflow engine again has take out the, the request and forwards it to the next particip participants. Though this means my task list is now reduced with the one task though. I show you this in an example. I log out and switch to another user from the finance department which is um, responsible for the final approval of purchase ordering. So we can see in this task list now again our new notebook request is here in an approval state. I can open it the same form, the same information and I can enter a comment just to complete the process here. I click on approve. Now the ordering process is completed or let's say the, the approving, the approved process of the ordering is completed. When I switch back to the initial user which has initiated this request I can see that the task is now in my own task list. This is because the approving was completed and I am now able to order the new notebook. What you can see here on the right side, which is very interesting, is the history. I can see every step the workflow goes through and all the persons who were involved in the process. So we can see who have created the process, who have approved it, and who was responsible for the final approval. This kind of information or documentation is very important when you have long-running processes. We want to see all the information and the history of the process. Though I will show you some additional features. The system provides me 
not only with the possibility to enter some information or documents, it is also able to generate documents. I have an example here. When I click on this link, you can see that an, an office editor opens in the, in the web form and I can edit a document here. This is an integration of LibreOffice, which allows me to create and edit Word or Excel sheets. And of course, the workflow engine can also generate this kind of documents because all the information I enter into the input form, depending on a workflow model, can be used by the workflow engine to create a document based on a template and fill out some important information. Though this kind to generate documents is also known as the output management. Another aspect of document management in workflow is the input management. I will show you an example here. The Emix workflow engine, or better, the Emix Office workflow suite, is able to import documents from various sources. For example, the system can look into an email box to receive invoices, or you can connect the office scanner where you scan paper documents and give them over to the workflow management system. I will simulate this now as an example. Let's say we have scanned this new document and I start the workflow. The workflow management system is now, as you can see here, processing the new document in the background. This means it makes a UCA, UCR analysis to extract the content from the document and the textual information is then put into a machine learning algorithm which can extract special information to start the correct workflow. When I click on refresh you can see now the system has automatically recognized that this is a receipt of an invoice from one of my service providers. When I click on the link now, I have the document and also already filled out some of the information here. The system is able to learn new information. For example, if something was wrong, I can overwrite the information here and the machine learning algorithms will automatically retrain the model in the background. Though this is a good example how you can connect machine learning aspects with workflow management aspects. And this gives you an impression how powerful this application suite is and how many possibilities you have to design your custom workflows. So that's it. Thanks a lot for your time and if you have any questions don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this conference about Lemon LDAPNG. We will talk about the new features in this software. My name is Clément Do. I work for Vortex and I'm a contributor of many open source projects around authentication, adapt directories, and identity federation, like Lemon and LapNG, on some of those. On the other side, I'm also a musician and an actor. If you want to know more, you can check my personal website, captain.org. Vortex is an open source company. We provide services about complex infrastructure, cloud mail authentication and security. And we also develop several solutions W Suite for collaboration, Wopla for cloud infrastructure, and WIDAS for identity and access management. Lemon LDAPNG is a web single sign on software. Web single sign on is how we provide a single authentication for the user when he access to web application. The flow is very simple. First, the user access to the application as is not yet authenticated on the application, he is redirected to the authentication portal. He logs on the portal and is redirected back to the application 
with a specific token, the application will get the token and validate it. How the token is validated can depend on the protocol CAS, SAML, or OpenID Connect. Okay. Lemon LDAPNG is a quite old project. It was founded in 2003. And the community released a new version every three or four years. We have a lot of features in Lemon LDAPNG. The first one is, of course, the single sign on and access control. The access control means we will be able to check the permission of the user before he access to an application. Lemon LDAPNG provides an application menu where the icons of each application are displayed depending on the access control. So the user will only see the application he can access. We are compatible with the three main single sign-on protocols, which are CAS, SAML, and OpenID Connect. We provide second factor authentication, password management. You can change or reset your password through Lemon LDAPNG, and of course, graphical customization. Some screenshots of the login form, the application menu, and the manager, which is the administration interface. Lemon LDAPNG is a full free software under the GPL license. We are hosted by OW2. We got a community award in 2014, and we are now part of the version IAM project, which gathered many open source software to provide a full identity on access management stack. So what's new? 2.0 version was released in 2018. We presented this version at OW2Con19, and you can check the presentation on Vortex website. In 2022, the version 2.0 is still the main version, but since four years, we added a lot of new features. Our current minor release is 2.0.14. The software provides commands. The first one is for configuration. You can get and set values in configuration. We added action to be able to save and restore configuration. And also a specific action named the rollback, which can be used if you made a mistake I want to go back to the previous version of the configuration. The second command is lemon LDAPNG sessions. It can be used to browse session. You can do it with the manager web interface, and now you can do it with this command. You can inspect session, uh, search for any session, edit, delete session, and we added specific actions for second factor on OpenID Connect constants. A brand new feature is the Manager API. These are REST web services that can be used to edit part of the configuration. You can only access to some part of the configuration. For example, to register new application, it can be CAS, application, SAML application, or OpenID Connect applications. You can also manage second factors. It means if a user lost his key, you can reset the second factor for the user through this API. And you can also edit the application menu, add an application, or remove an application. Some improvement in the SAML protocol. The first one is the use of SHA-256 as a default algorithm. And you can now directly generate a certificate in the manager to be able to publish the public key. It is very useful because a lot of SAML applications are not able to read directly a public key, but are only able to read a certificate. Main improvements are related to the OpenID Connect protocol. Big developments have been made on this part. The first one is the use of the refresh tokens. A refresh token is a specific token that can be used to get a new access token when the first access token has expired. The refresh token can be linked to the current session. It means 
the refresh token will be deleted when the user logs out. Or you can also use refresh tokens as long life tokens. This is what we do with offline mode. It means that even if the user is disconnected, you can use this token to get a new access token for the user. There is a new endpoint, which is called introspection. This new endpoint can be used by application to check the validity of an access token. We are now able to publish claims in ID token and access token. And to finish, we implemented new grants. In O2 and OpenID Connect, a grant is the method we use to get our access token and ID token. By default, we use the authorization code grant. And now in Lemon and Dapp, we can use resource owner password credential and client credential grants. Another new feature is the hook system. With hooks, you can act on any request or response that are sent to Lemon and LabNG on the free protocols, CAS, SAML, or OpenID Connect. It is very useful if an application is not really compatible with the standard and you need to tweak a little the message. The last one is a password hook, which can be used to forward the password to another application when it is changed in Lemon and LabNG. Before 2.0, there was no password policy in Lemon and LabNG. The only way to manage password policy was to use OpenLDAP or any compatible LDAP directory and check the password on server side. Now you can configure password policy directly in Lemon and LabNG and the password will be checked before being sent to the LDAP directory. On the graphical side, the user is now able to see if the password is correct or not before sending it to the server. Second factor authentication is a very important feature of Lemon and LabNG. It was created in 2.0 and we added some new backends like Radius and WebButton. As you may know, U2F is not deprecated. U2F was FIDO1 and WebButton is FIDO2. So you now have to use WebButton instead of U2F. There are now two ways of using second factor in Lemon and LabNG. In our first implementation, the second factor was asked when user authenticates. Now we can choose to ask the second factor only when the user access an application. It means you will be able to configure your application to require a higher level of authentication and this authentication level will only be given to the user with the second factor. Maybe you have heard about adaptive authentication and risk-based authentication. It means that we will evaluate the context of authentication. For example, if the user connects outside from the local network or from another country, you can require a second factor. Last point, if you use TOTP, you can now encrypt the secrets inside the session. We did not only work on the code, we also spent a lot of time on documentation. All the documentation was written with things. We also made a new website and we hope you will like it. How keep informed about Lebanon and LabNG? First, you can register to the announced mailing list. We only send a mail when a new version is released. You can check the project updates on OW2 website. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. This is the end of the presentation. Thanks a lot. I will be available for any question on the chat and I hope we can meet later. Goodbye. Professionals involved in open source success stories rarely speak out. We are fortunate enough to have two of them ready to talk. Grazia Kazin is Knowledge Director from Engineering Group she is involved in big data analysis activities for smart city and industry 4.0 projects. She will present several knowledge use cases. But first, Christophe Modou from Gendarmerie Nationale Information System is presenting his use case focused on the advanced usage of Lemon LDAP NJ. Hello everyone, 
Welcome to AW2 Con22. I'm Christophe Monou, network and system engineer and PhD student in cybersecurity. I'm also Lemon LDAP MG Web SSO maintainer. Today, I will present you Lemon LDAP MG Advanced Usage by Gendarmerie National. My presentation is organized as follows. In the first part, I will introduce Lemon LDAP MG. In the second part, I will describe some access management and uh, architecture. In the third part, I will explain some, I will present you some specific needs and uh, the corresponding plugins. Lemonel LAPNG is a full AAA open source, open source web SSO project. Lemonel LAPNG has been created in 2004 by the French Gendarmerie National. The first stable version has been released in 2010. The last stable version is the 2.0.14 version. This version has been released in 2022. LLNG won two OW2 Community Award in 2014 and 18. LLNG core team is composed of five members. Xavier Guimard, Christophe Modou, your presenter from Gendarmerie Nationale, Clément Oudo, Maxime Besson, and David Kouteler for from Vortex. Since many years, it's a real win-win partnership between Vortex and Gendarmerie Nationale. Together, we fix bugs and develop new features. The development process of Lemon LDAP NG is composed of two cycles. The main cycle is the communal development cycle, which is uh, provided by the OW2 Internet GitLab. This, this forge allows core team to develop new features and fix bugs. Also, uh, user can uh, submit some merge request or open issue by using this OW2 forge or ask a question by using our mailing list. The second cycle is the Gendarmerie National Integration Cycle. When a new version is released by the community, I pick this version and I, I install it on our development or qualification platform. If tests are okay, this version is deployed on pre-production platform. Some weeks later, this version is, is deployed on our production platform. Since 2004, Gendarmerie Nationale is a major Lemon LDAP NG contributor and an advanced user. How LLNG works? First, an unauthenticated user tries to access to a protected app. This user is not authenticated, so LLNG, more precisely the handler part, redirect user to the portal for authentication. Then, after, authent after authentication, LLNG portal provides to the user a SSO token, which is a cookie, and we redirect the user to the original app application. The user tries to access again to the app, but with its uh, SSO cookie, so the handler lets the user access to the app application. All our platforms are based on the same architecture. LNG architecture is composed of, of uh, six main components. The manager to uh, configure the web SSO, the portal to authenticate the user, the handler part, this part can be directly ended by the application or deployed on reverse proxies. And applications are protected are hidden behind this reverse, pro this reverse proxies. User cannot access directly to the protected app. All the requests are catched by the reverse proxies and intercepted by the handler 
to, to check uh, access. Configuration, SSO configuration and session are stored in databases which can be uh, Postgre, DAP, or Redis on our, our development platform. The main part is the uh, LDAP server, which is a master LDAP server where all user accounts are stored. It's important because all our platform use only slaves. So all the users as, as have got the same password on each platform. User can connect to production, training, pre-prod and uh, platform by using its own credential. Why Gendarmerie Nationale manage different SSO platforms? Because each platform meets a specific need. On our development platform, all users has, all user has got the same password. We, I developed a plugin to um, all the all the users can connect to the development password by using the same password. On our pre-production platform, uh, users can impersonate an, another user for testing purpose. On our training platform, it's the same, but I appended a module to allow the user to search for a specific account to impersonate. On our production platform, I developed the switch context module, which allows some users to uh, switch context another user for debug debugging purpose. All our platform use uh, also the check user profile. This module, the check user plugin, sorry, this plugin allow uh, project manager, development team, or, admi or administrator to check user profile, access right, and either send to protected, protected app or SSO session. Here, it's our uh, development platform portal. As you can see here, users can log in by using professional ID card or uh, credential. Speci the specificity of this platform is uh, it's, a, all user, it's a same password for all users. As described here, uh, all personnel use the same password test. How implement these features, you have to select authentication choice to propose authentication choice. When you select authentication choice, you can select which module you want to propose. SSL module, this module corresponds to ID card, a professional ID card. Custom module, I don't use the default LDAP module to uh, propose a login password authentication, I, I select custom module. The last one, slave module, is not explained uh, during this presentation. When you select custom module, you can set which uh, custom module you want to use. I develop a specific module, Proxima Hot Generate Password. And you can uh, set uh, parameters. Here, I, uh, it, the, I set this uh, parameter password with the value test. On a dev platform, it's the same password for all users except admins. Admins is members of SU group. During authentication process, LLMG uh, follows different steps. As you can see here, some steps are called entry point. When a plugin reaches the, uh, the corresponding entry point, the, uh, the corresponding function is executed by LLNG. Here is the code of the generic password package. Authenticate method always return OK. And when authentication process reaches the entry point after data, Check generic password function is executed by the portal. If the user is protected, anonymous, or member of the SU group, admin, the parent authenticate function inherited from LDAP is executed, so 
the user must provide its own password. If it's not an admin or anonymous user, the password must be equal to test. On our pre-production platform, it's the same. Uh, I enable choice authentication modules, but with SSL and uh, LDAP. But as you can, you can see here, um, a new field is displayed. By using this field, user can select a space and another account to impersonate. As you can see here, I'm, I use my own credential, Christophe Modu and my password, and I select to impersonate Antoine Rosier account. I log in as Christophe Modu, but I'm authenticated as Antoine Rosier, as you can see here. This functionality can be enabled by using impersonation module. You can set here a rule to avoid some identity to be impersonated. Some identity can be forbidden to impersonate by using this rule. On our training platform, it's the same like as the pre-production platform, as ID card, LDAP, um, impersonation, but here there is a, a new button. When you click on this button, a, a pop-in is displayed where you can uh, specify some criteria. And when you click on search for account, LLNG portal suggests you an, an account corresponding to the uh, criteria. An account is randomly suggested depending on provided filter. This feature is, is enabled by using the search for user account. You can set your searching attribute, which, com which compose the form. And excluding attribute, this attribute can be used for to avoid some account to be uh, proposed. On our production platform, I develop a module named uh, Context Switching. This module allows allo uh, some users to, to switch context for another user. Be careful, this module is for debugging purpose only. All the starting and end, and end of in-person process are locked. logged. When you click on this menu, a form is display where you can specify which account you want to switch context. During switch content process, multi-factor authentication devices are not submitted and history is not updated. This module is enabled by using the switch context and other user plugin. You can specify on or a special, special rule to define which user are allowed to uh, switch context. At least uh, on uh, our all platform, I um, enable the check user plugin. This plugin allows some uh, an administrator, uh, project manager, or uh, development, development team to check access right and uh, SSO se session. Here, you provide a, an, uh, an account, you provide an URL, and the plugin um, show you if the user is allowed or, for, or, or forbidden to access. This plugin dis also display uh, either sent to protected, protected application, and you can see here all the user session data. This plugin displays all session data, so you can uh, define some uh, attribute to hide or uh, some header you don't want to display. This plugin helps um, to check access right and header sent to protected app. Many thanks for your attention. We can keep in touch by using this email address or uh, URLs. Thanks for your attention.
Good morning. I'm uh, Grazia Cazzin from Engineering Group. I'm in charge of the offering the data and analytics domain, and I'm the leader of Knowage, the first European open source project for business intelligence and data visualization, and one of the longest running projects in the OW2 consortium. I want to show you some real use cases we worked on using open source for industrial purposes on data and analysis domain. Engineering, the main sponsor of Knowage, is the first Italian private company in system integration with more than uh, 11,000 uh, employees. We are an international player working in every market. And um, herein, we are part of a specific data and analytics competence center based on a multidisciplinary team of professionals um, that manage the entire data life cycle, from data collection and management to quality and governance up to the best visualization of results. So let's start by trying to say what Knowage is in a few words. Knowage is the only open source suite that satisfies the ABI criteria defined by Gartner. That means it fully supports the BI requirements and the modern needs such as self-service and ad hoc reporting. Moreover, it offers mesh up capabilities to combine data coming from different sources, high level customization options, so as you can reach exactly the data experience you want. Obviously, um, Knowage natively supports multi device usage, and uh, more interesting topics that allow you to get data from various data sources even at the same time, even at the same time. So as you can you can use any data for the goal you have in an open architecture that makes integration tasks easier. And this subject is an important enabler if you are looking for a product to embed in yours, as for the OEM solution. And Noage is an open source suite not only because you can find the source code, but also because it adopts open standards. And for sure, you can guarantee the users thanks to the facility and support you can have with the Enterprise Edition. At least it can work on-premise or on cloud uh, following your data or services strategies as uh, you can combine as you want. So what you can do with Knowledge so far? Basically, you can start from the, the traditional static reports that you can even produce in a batch way and send to your spread users by email and move up to the more modern interactive capabilities like OLAP the multidimensional analysis and interactive dashboards that allow you to combine data coming from different sources and then surfing them in an intuitive way. In addition, you have the QBE for visual data exploration and KPIs to measure your performances according with thresholds and providing alarms. Noite supports spatial data. And more in general, with data mashup, you can combine different technologies such as structured data on RDBMS, solar indexes, or spatial data. You can have his own user. You can have his own workspace to customize his environment, build his own dashboard, explore his own data space, and upload the private data for a full self-service capability. Moreover, you can embed custom code to build empowered analytics and advanced data visualization for infographics or storytelling. Everything at the enterprise level with security, profiling, multi-tenant multi metadata, and any kind of management features. More in detail, looking at the customization capabilities uh, in an open architecture, you can plug your own HTML widget into the product. You can use your favorite charting library and you can even plug your R or Python script for powerful data visualization. From the 8 series, you can save every custom widget you built in the new gallery on the left to make them available to other users or for other dashboards. With the gallery, you can uh, transform any custom code you write into a kind of template you can use again and again. And in a similar way, on the new function catalog on the right part of the screen, uh, you can collect your R or Python piece of code so that you can write custom functions to perform more analytical tasks such as prediction, clustering, classification, text stackings, and so on. 
The function catalog allows you, your data scientist to write custom functions that can then be easily used by any other user without uh, R or Python skills. And now, have a look at two different use cases we worked on using these new integration practices for valuable end-to-end -end solutions. The first one is about a quick project we developed for an Italian region at the time of the emergencies last year when the pandemic was so raw. First, we start with descriptive analysis because the Ministry for Health defined the measures and KPIs every region must send to the central government to collect information not only from a clinical point of view, but also as far as concerns the efficacy, efficacy and um, capacity in handling the emergency. This information were, were useful, first of all, to local administrations to better understand its capability, its capacity, and potential faults of its services. So we developed a set of ministerial indicators to figure out how things were going, also from an organizational point of view, uh, so as to improve effort wherever they need. Each measure had different logic and rules, so the main effort was to set up a common management to show results and uh, be ready to add uh, new measures without a reward, because as you know, at the time, rules uh, changed uh, every day. So here we worked uh, with data coming from local units, and we built a very flexible model in a short time, making the local government ready to know how it was performing in managing the emergency, and they're ready to easily provide data to the central government. We did it in a very short time using a full open source stack that, uh, because of based on structured data only, involved uh, PostgreSQL, RDBMS, and uh, Talent Open Studio, ZTL, and NoAge for dashboarding and data extraction for the central government. The second step was in the clinical area to predict the pandemic trends. Especially for intensive care, care unit, the uh, urgent question was the, to know how many new entries there will be, so as to organize the right services and or set the new strategies to avoid the collapse of the medical structures. So the goal was to predict the key indicators in terms of uh, the number of currently positive people, the air con T, the intensive care, the number of health, the number of deaths. And uh, in this case, uh, the end user was the decision, decision maker. So he needed to have this prediction anytime, anywhere, and the mobile usage become the first option. And of course, forecast had to be reliable. To achieve this goal, internal data were not enough because uh, local trends couldn't describe a global pandemic scenario of the world we live in. So we started using open data, Italian open data from the civil defense that described the Italian trends at national, regional, and provincial level. The demographic data from the ISTAT, the Italian Institute for Statistics, um, on the Italian civil population and the global data from the John Hopkins University. This way, and starting from uh, the SEER models already available as Python libraries, we developed an optimized and self-adaptative model. Moreover, we use internal data from the region to apply corrective strategies and optimize specific phenomena such as uh, territorial differences, uh, uh, temporal dynamics, and specific behaviors. To validate the results, we use models to measure the errors. But most importantly, we develop dashboards able to compare the prediction with the subsequent uh, real data that were coming over time. And the result was so satisfactory, they say that, that it was the best prediction they have, that we went on, adding in time the, vaccine, the, the data about the uh, vaccine uh, campaign to fit the models to the changing scenario. And we always do that using open source tech based on PostgreSQL, Talent, and NoAge, and Python. 
In this short video, you can see the result, also in terms of usability and data visualization, based on the mobile first parting, very easy and intuitive to use even for unskilled people. Predictions were not shown to uh, data scientists here. We have more analytical dashboard for them. Here, the complex results become very easy to use and understand for the end user so that he can immediately understand what he needs to act upon. The second case is about a cross-industry solution we developed starting from the distancing measure requirements, again, think, thinking about the needs of the uh, pandemic. CFAE is our artificial intelligence-based video and image uh, images uh, uh, analytic solution to monitor that social distancing is maintained by people in public space. It can be used to protect public health by helping people comply with social distancing measures in the post-COVID uh, phases. And CFI works with video from uh, surveillance systems and analyze humans in real time to count people within a certain area to evaluate the size of the area and the number of people inside, providing others if the ratio is over the threshold, evaluate the distance between people, sending alert if uh, there is not enough distance, and detect people without the right PPE, the personal protective equipment. Here you can see a picture of the logical uh, architecture in which we adopt different strategy to, strategies to handle with machine le learning and artificial intelligence models, uh, a continuous video streaming to avoid unwanted breaks uh, and waiting time in the video streams. We work uh, splitting the flow into fragments uh, and reaching each fragment uh, with machine learning and artificial intelligence models and combining the result in the end uh, in a new continuous stream that we show as a result. Over there, we detect and count people in a certain, uh, in a certain area, providing alarms if they are too many. We evaluated the distance uh, between people, two or more, sending an alarm if between them there is less distance than certain thresholds. We build an end-to-end -end application based on knowledge as user interface where you can link the video camera and, uh, and uh, upload a video uh, to analyze for the different purposes I said, always having the, ch the, the, ch the, the chance to change the point of view and to collect uh, the detected alarms. And in the end, we provide uh, historical dashboards to check uh, uh, how many alerts we had in a certain area, in a certain period, and so on. And also here, we think with uh, open source using uh, NiFi, Kafka, Kubernetes, Python, PostgreSQL, and uh, Noage. CFIE was created in pandemic time, but can also be useful in normal time. For example, to estimate the number of people waiting for our services or people at an event and so on. Going to the end, what are the benefits of using open source for every kind of enterprises? We are talking about professional open source, which means high quality and trustability. Open source drives innovation and enables reuse by default. By choosing open source when possible, you support and contribute to create value for everyone, not just for someone. And last but not least, we have a European best of breed open source solution. I think that at this historical time, it's something, something to be considered. Thank you, and uh, I hope to see you in person next time. Here comes a highly anticipated track. The Quick App track starts with four talks by Martin Alvarez and Lionel Zhao from Huawei, Benoit Alessandroni, Starting Blocks, and Christian Patterson, Open App. It will be followed by a roundtable with three experts ready to outline the next interactions with mobile users. A great panel to come with Gail Duval, e Foundation, Ilker Aydin, Famobi, Thomas Steiner, Google, and Christian Patterson. But let's start this track first. Martin Alvarez, please, with the present trends in mobile app technologies.
Hi, my name is Martin Alvarez and I work as a web technology expert for Huawei, focused on web technology standardization. I will be presenting some history and trends in mobile app technologies. Starting by the prehistory, 30, more than 30 years ago, uh, when all started. Starting by the web, invented in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee, one year later, he created the first browser uh, of the history, called the World Wide Web. Some years later, in 1993, NSCA uh, uh, launched the first version of Mosaic, that uh, after that it was uh, called uh, Netscape, very popular at that time. This is uh, considered as the first uh, smartphone. Tim Berners-Lee, uh, along with some other colleagues, founded the W3C, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium. They were able to play uh, the snake game on Nokia's, reinstalling some Nokia's. After some iterations on the platforms and applications, we reached the modern age of uh, mobile app technologies. In 2007, Apple launched the first version of the iPhone. W3C uh, released the first uh, version of the guidelines, the mobile web best practices. At this time, we started talking of mobile apps and content. One year later, we saw the first Android phone for both iOS, the uh, App Store, and for Android, uh, Google launched the Android market. One year later, in uh, 2009, uh, Chrome OS was uh, launched publicly, and at that time as well, we could install the Angry Birds, the very popular. In 2010, in the middle of the uh, uh, fight between native applications and web applications, we saw this controversial article speaking about the future of native instead of web apps. App was the most popular word. Amazon launched the App Store as an alternative uh, App Store for Android, and Huawei launched the App Gallery in China. And at that time, WeChat was created, the popular um, social network. In 2013, Firefox OS was released, running web applications. And uh, we start in a new era where we see not only a native of web, but hybrid applications that we can consider lighter applications. Light applications like instant, instant apps uh, released by Google. 2018, Microsoft announced that uh, the Microsoft Store will host progressive web applications. So it's not only for native, the web is also in desktop. Also Project Fugu, led, led by uh, Google, but also with the participation of uh, Microsoft, Intel, and some other web players, to expand the web cap capabilities like in native. In 2019, we saw WeChat to become the largest standalone app. It's not a platform, it's just a super app hosting different mini apps or what they call mini programs where users can interact services, products, mini programs within the main uh, application, which is uh, which happened. So mini app vendors created their own versions of this light app ecosystem. And also Harmony OS was launched in, at that time. One year later in 2020, so very recently, uh, Apple announced App Clips, a similar approach where users can uh, experience a dynamic feature instead of having a permanently installed applications. In 2021, we saw the creation of a new group in W3C to uh, create an homogeneous representation and homogeneous uh, set of specifications for this new concept of mini apps growing, especially in China, but with the specific motivation of aligning with the existing W3C technologies, like the progressive web applications. The main uh, mini-app vendors like Baidu, Huawei, Xiaomi, Alibaba, uh, 360, with some existing W3C members like Google, Microsoft, Intel, Rakuten, to explore this uh, alignment. We are experiencing the evolution of this light app ecosystem, like uh, TikTok, like Facebook, where we can play, for instance, inst instant games without leaving the main environment. But also we see the evolution of uh, the standard um, applications like the progressive web applications. That is something similar. Instead of having a super app, we have the browser. So the main web browser vendors are evolving 
these uh, technologies to make progressive web applications as the universal platform to deliver these applications to any platform, to any user. Some other platforms hosting specific applications, hybrid applications like Chaos, like App Clips, as I mentioned before, for Apple, and also for Android. Instant apps, Amazon web applications, uh, Android Go, and different uh, version of the um, uh, similar with a direct interaction to, with the user, including as well quick apps. In terms of the growth of these standards, uh, these web standards, we are experiencing an amazing uh, growth in the in the traffic. Perhaps we don't notice uh, that, but uh, these enhanced enhanced uh, website are everywhere. For instance, when you open uh, Twitter on a web browser, you have the possibility to install the application, so you are accessing a progressive web application. Uh, some other concepts uh, like uh, the Web three. Uh, providing decentralized decentralization this uh, new concept of uh, applications running on decentralized platforms like uh, the blockchains are uh, gaining traction and we have a lot of examples that uh, we can test and uh, we can experience right now now we are facing different requirements driven by the end users different scenarios and we want to deliver experiences not the tedious process of getting an application from a uh, marketplace, installing the application, registering. So we want to deliver the product, the service, without this friction. So we want direct interaction, just coding once and deliver everywhere, and having more security and privacy for the end users. Thank you for watching. Feel free to ask me any questions and uh, see you soon. Here is Benoit, the CTO of Starting Blocks, and today we'll talk about our vision of the real web free and how interoperability and decentralization are the foundation of that. So let's discuss the current state of the art of the web architecture. Um, web 2, which has been there for around 15 years, is the monopolistic web platforms and has succeeded as, at disabling web innovation by uh, forbidding access to large user base to small scale innovators like startups and small enterprise small companies. Um, opposed to that, uh, the last years we've seen the emergence of the web free philosophy, which uh, main goal is decentralization. Um, this decentralization can think technically be reached uh, by two different uh, approaches. Uh, one which has been conceptually there for around 30 years, uh, revolved around the semantic web-based technologies. Uh, two major implementations of that, uh, which are publicly available right now, are the Fediverse with Mastodon, Jaspora, Peertube, and, and the solid web-based initiative, um, which is the initiative led by Sir Tim Berners-Lee since 2015. And um, for some years now, we have a new player in town, uh, which is also promoting decentralization, which are the blockchains, uh, web-based technology, and what we could uh, present as a distributed ledger technologies. Um, so, what does that mean to achieve web free? At certain blocks, we are convinced that achieving decentralization can only be done through interoperability. It requires standards adoption on a few different things, like data structure. Uh, which in the case of semantic web-based technology is provided by the resource description framework, and in the case of blockchain technology is provided by uh, agreement and uh, JSON uh, standard structure, uh, like we can see on NFTs with some uh, ERC and um, and some uh, and uh, identity too, and. It also needs uh, standards adoptions on communication protocols. Um, how do you 
authenticate and identify your user is a pretty important question. And uh, if we discuss distributed identification, some standards are, are incomplete, but has been there for a few years now, like OpenID Connect based on OAuth. Um, and because it's those, those, those identity standards, those identification standards are web-based, we can also see now the emergence of a new family of standards um, like decentralized identifiers. We are trying to merge the identification approach of blockchain on one side and web-based platform on the other side so that um, uh, platforms can actually uh, easily uh, share the user base independently from storing them on uh, usual web architectures on our blockchains. And uh, we think that's a really important uh, next step for the web in general. Um, other things you need to uh, really standardize is notifications. Notifications are everywhere. We can talk about email notification, push notifications, notification between application agents. Uh, so notification is a really important topic. And if you wish to deliver interoperability at the web scale level, then you need standard adoption on how do you structure notifications and how they are interpreted and used. Um, the third thing is access requests and grants. Um, if you consider personal identity buried by any kind of system and the personal data can be stored everywhere, depending, it could be on uh, databases, it could be on suite pods, it could be on blockchains, then you need a standard adoption on how do you manage applications to ask for access on the, those data and how do you grant access on those data applications per applications and at a granular level. Uh, so those are also uh, standards which are uh, uh, really important and are the foundation of the, of the next, uh, um, next generation of web applications. Um, I would like to notice also that blockchain are decentralized by nature, but uh, communication between different blockchains and communication between the one blockchain and web application uh, is done by uh, not universal API, so it can be considered at the same interaction between Facebook and any kind of application, so it's kind of a big silo. It's a decentralized silo, but it's a silo. Uh, what about the weaknesses and opportunities of those concepts? Um, the Sanjay Identifier standardized identification mechanism, and it's one of the really big uh, steps to be achieved. And what it would enable is uh, uh, a trust mechanism at the web scale level uh, to fight fake news in general, but like more generally to certify the origin of any kind of content by applying and implementing verifiable credentials, which are part of vocabulary, so semantic web-based, and part um, uh, crypto-based solution because it's based on a signature of content. Um, possible applications for those standards are a distributed-like mechanism, a diploma certification, skill validation, passport, passport uh, validation by institutions, and uh, content traceability. For us as Europeans, it's really important as it could enable native compliance with the law, uh, especially the RGPD or the DMA, and uh, that's really something to consider uh, uh, at a web scale level. What about the position of starting block there? Uh, at starting blocks, we ambition to become the WordPress of Web3, uh, and for that, we are working on building a no-code decentralized application builder uh, based on what we call blocks, which are web components, standard web components, 
and which allows any any developers and any user to store the data on solid based pods, but to use crypto based and blockchain based identification systems. Um, so we are really working our way around the standards for the next generation of web application. And what is our relation with the Quick App Initiative? Um, we all know that mobile now represents the majority of the internet traffic and that it requires tooling and development platforms to emerge. Uh, and uh, at certain blocks, we need uh, a standard on that. We also like the approach of modularity we can find uh, on uh, the quick apps uh, standard with the usage of uh, web components uh, or components uh, versus page. And we foresee transpiling possibilities so that uh, an app and a, a development of blocks could actually uh, natively be compatible with both both our uh, current uh, platform and application and with uh, quick apps. And another, um, another important thing is that we have equivalent technological stack, uh, which are lightweight and accessible, accessible in terms of it's easy to find developers and it's easy to find contributors uh, because it's based around the JavaScript technology, which are pretty common nowadays. So um, that's it, guys. Uh, let me know if I, if you have any question, and I hope you learned something today. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben from Huawei Quick App. In the digital area, developers spark magic that can change the world profoundly by providing exciting experience and app for users. Today, I would like to share with you how Huawei Quick App has helped developers grow their business in the Chinese mainland. Huawei Quick App is essential to Huawei app ecosystem. We are now providing exclusive Quick App services for users in more than 170 countries or regions. They can access app content with a single tap, no installation needed, and no worry for insufficient traffic or space. Thanks to wide-ranging content contributed by our partner developers, the number of Huawei Quick App has increased by 25%, with user activity improved by a staggering 23%. This app served 160 million users worldwide each month, a 200% increase over the past two years. For Huawei device user, Quick App can be assessed from diverse means, from App Gallery, Assistant Today, Huawei Browser, to popular app in China, regardless of whether the user is using mobile phone, tablet, or PC, or is driving a car, they can get the services they want to suit their needs, including travel, reading, and more. A Quick App fan can easily find Quick App in many ways. For example, Quick App Center added to the home screen, the Quick App car in Assistant Today, an app search function and homepage for accommodate Quick App on App Gallery. When they find the app they love, they can add apps to the home screen, fit with them, or share them with friends. Commonly used Quick App are quite noticeable in Assistant Today and Huawei browsers. Now, some developer has been syncing partnership with top apps in China, through which they want to promote their Quick Apps for greater business success. Quick Apps are not limited to mobile phone. They can be found everywhere, in a car, on a computer on your desk, or on TV in your living room. Such an exclusive experience has been made available for users from more than 170 countries and regions. Next, I'd like to share with you a few success stories about what Quick App has achieved for developers in Chinese mainland. The first story is about Novo Rating Bar, one of the most favorite rating Quick App in China. A few years ago, 
developer of this app realized that QuickCap form would be their growth point. The form features tap to use and make app content so instant that user acquisition costs can be significantly reduced by times. This means an equivalent increase of revenues. This opportunity has Novel Reading Bar acquired 88% more user in the past year. Another case is SF Express, one of the most trusty logistics service provider in China. The provider leveraged the Quick App form to provide both online and offline premium services of tens of millions of users at minimum cost. Its Quick App user can double in the past year. Next, let's see how they achieved their success. Thanks to exciting services our developer has provided for hundreds of millions of users, 150% more quick apps integrated Huawei ads for more impression in the past year. This increased the revenue of both Huawei ads and joint operation by 235%. In-app purchases is another powerful monetization measure. By integrating this service, QuickCap gain access to rather competitive payment assurance and billing services. As a quite monetizable, quick apps that integrate Huawei Ads Now have access to main screen ad formats such as Native, Rewarded, Banner, Instadicial, and Splash in more than 150 industries. So, is it complex to develop a quick app? Let me show you how our tens of thousands of developers did it. Huawei Quick App Ecosystem now offers a complete development service toolchain. Development based on an existing mini program takes as short as two days. And that from scratch can be possibly completed within one week. In addition, popular development tools such as Coco's Creator are also supported. Quick App IDE makes the development even easier. You can import a mini program with a single click for Quick App development. This helps minimize your development cost. In addition, Huawei provides developers with a complete set of cloud development services to support one-stop device and cloud development. Developers can obtain up-to-date data from Huawei developers and edges product strategy accordingly in a timely manner. If you are interested in Huawei Quick App and want to learn more, scan the QR code while looking for a world to join us to build our ecosystem together. Let's provide ultimate experience for users and make the world a better place. This is all the sharing for today and thanks for your attention and goodbye. Hi, I'm Christian Patterson, and I'd like to introduce you to the OW2 Quick App Initiative. So we saw in the previous presentations how Quick Apps are really this amazing dynamic. Um, they create lots of opportunities for businesses and some great new experiences for users. And in fact, users are loving Quick Apps when they get to use them. Now, if we think about the mobile app landscape more generally, we actually think we're coming to a uh, inflection point. And this inflection point that's being driven by various pressures. These pressures are things like technology trends, new trends in technology, uh, augmented reality, um, you know, displays in cars, uh, connected uh, objects, um, and all these uh, devices which are now connected needing their own apps. And certain frustrations from the market, such as user fatigue or developer frustrations and, and publisher frustrations with uh, the, the app uh, process these days. And regulators equally are looking in on this, how to ensure that app uh, marketplaces are open and are as dynamic as possible. So we really think there's an opportunity here. And to realize this opportunity, we think of an emerging ecosystem. Now, when I think of an ecosystem, especially one that's kind of growing and emerging like this, I really like to think of it like an engine. So I'm thinking of, you know, the technology side. It's a big cog, right? It's driving the ecosystem. But actually, the technology by itself, you know, it doesn't, doesn't do much. So it has to be in partnership with business. And to make sure it's working across all the parties of the ecosystem in a kind of a symbiotic way, 
We also have to think about standards and how we can ensure that the technology can get to different devices and different manufacturers and suppliers. So these are really important cogs in our ecosystem engine. But what's also and equally important is the oil that these cogs are immersed in. And that oil, I think in increasingly, is open source. So you guys are going to love that, of course. Now, you guys are also the kingmakers. You're the developers, right? And you are the spark that makes, makes the engine turn. Without you, nothing happens. Um, and of course, the kingmakers, the spark plugs, need their oxygen and the oxygen is coming from the community so the oxygen the community is creating this oxygen feeding it in creating the spark um, and turning this engine fantastic now the ow2 quick app initiative is uh, really community focused so we really want to double down on that whole notion of community bringing the oxygen in and creating that spark along with the developers it has four ambitions to raise awareness with developers uh, and businesses and users, to build a commons of knowledge, not just on how to create uh, uh, quick apps from a technical standpoint, but also, of course, how to uh, use quick apps um, in a business uh, perspective, things like uh, use cases and proof of concepts. Um, and we also want to think about, well, how can we help developers with this? You know, what can we do from uh, the, the tooling side of things? And the final uh, ambition is really to say, well, you know, uh, since we know that standards are an important part of creating a, a equitable uh, ecosystem uh, that runs across devices and, and from different vendors, um, how can we feed up into that standardization process? How can we support it? And how can we also work with the standards organizations on this? So it's really a broad uh, a broad base of different ambitions here, but all interacting to create this kind of organic growth. Now, the Quick App Initiative is open by design. There's no pay to play. Uh, anyone can join. You just have to register and registering is easy. You say, yes, I agree to the charter and that's it. You've registered. Um, uh, so the charter was created by the different uh, participants um, when the initiative launched. It's a democratic charter. We're consensus driven, transparent. We publish up minutes of meetings, things like that. Um, and the tasks, the, the actions of the initiative are run through task forces, which are led by different participants, using OW2 tools, uh, delivering shareable outputs, uh, things like OSI or uh, Creative Commons outputs. So it's really uh, a, a, an open by design initiative. Um, now, this conference today actually marks the one year anniversary of the Quick App Initiative. Way! Um, uh, we launched last year in OW2Con. Uh, since then, uh, really an interesting journey, an amazing journey, I would say. Um, starting to foster and put in place all the building blocks of this amazing community. So we've got some great uh, participants that have joined us at the launch and joined us as we, uh, we, we went through the, the year. Um, we've done some interesting editorials. Uh, we've opened the developer portal with uh, some really rich documentation there for developers. Um, and thank you again to Systematic and the Hub Open Source for the recognition that they um, uh, gave to us uh, around this uh, initiative. So, I mean, really a fantastic first year. Very, very, very exciting. Um, but if you think first year was exciting, but our second year is even more exciting, right? So we're going to double down on the community stuff because, hey, community is everything, right? But what really excites me the most is this possibility to use the Talanto platform to f to uh, create educational challenges. Now, I think that's super exciting because, you know, students, well, of course, they're the future, but students come up with so many wild and wacky ideas. You know, it's out of the box thinking, no constraints on, you know, what they can think about. Um, a source of inspiration for everyone, right? So uh, we're very lucky because Huawei has very kindly um, offered to uh, create a relationship with Talanto and then to offer or to open that relationship to the participants of the initiative so that they uh, can also issue challenges uh, through the initiative um, into Talanto. So that's very exciting, right? And we'll obviously take those initiatives and the other ideas and we'll work with businesses to launch uh, proof of concepts and pilots and all of this kind of stuff. And we have some great pilot apps already kind of on the drawing boards. Um, and we're also, I'm really happy to, to be saying, we're also in some deep discussion with the W3C about organizing some events. So, you know, it's going to be a really cool year um, and I think we're going to see a lot of movement.
Now, if this interests you as much as it interests me, please come and read uh, more about it on the portal. Feel free to e email us and to ask questions, um, and of course, follow us on social media. Um, so that's the OW2 Quick App Initiative. I think it's a fantastic dynamic. It's going to create this new ecosystem in Europe and create opportunities for everyone. Um, come join, come see what all the fun is about. Now, um, thank you for your time today. Have a great um, conference. To continue with quick apps, I will show you how to code, how to develop a real quick app in just five minutes. All well, started with this project to, prom to promote the cultural heritage and history in uh, small towns across Europe. This is based on open source, open data, crowdsourced and sustainable. We follow the no code approach, trying to avoid any IT skill uh, to replicate and to develop and to deploy a new project. The application is based on geolocation. The end user will be informed about the uh, distance between the user and the point of interest. The details of the points of interest uh, can be enriched using the open data uh, sources, like the Wikipedia, uh, images from the Wikipedia, from other sources like the open data initiatives, as I will show. And also we offer some other capabilities like sharing the points of interest using uh, Twitter, WhatsApp, whatever you, you have installed in your, uh, in your device. The application is based on uh, these two main parts that are available in the Quick App Initiative repository. So you can have access to this, you can clone it and you can start your own project. And this is the process. You can clone the project, so you will have the quick app code and also the configuration and the database. Only in one hour you can customize the application and also you can have access to the configuration uh, files and the database that will be hosted publicly in a JIT repository. Using the uh, GitHub or GitLab pages, you will be able to publish this information that will be the information that will feed the quick app. So just to start, optionally, we can preload information coming from open data sources. We have some scripts to uh, load the first batch of uh, points of interest using a um, generic spreadsheet. This can be enriched by a local expert. There is an automatic conversion tool that uh, will help us to convert the spreadsheet into a JSON file that will be uh, the JSON file that uh, contains the points of interest that will be fed into the uh, repository. Based on this project, we did another proof of concept. In this case, for Brussels. In Brussels, there is a comic book road uh, that uh, includes different paintings on walls across the city to pay tribute to uh, authors and characters of uh, Belgian comics. We took the data uh, provided by the Open Data uh, Initiative in Brussels, the official data set. We loaded the project in OpenRefine. This is an open source tool that helps us to curate and to uh, clean the data, 64 points of interest, these uh, paintings. We did some cleansing, uh, separating coordinates, uh, the components, the latitude and longitude, and some other uh, cleansing of the data. Also separating authors, because they were all together, if more than one author per um, painting was included. So we separated in different columns. So the main character of the painting or representing the painting is usually in the Wikipedia. It has some entries in the Wikipedia. So we try to find this information to fetch the information from the Wikipedia. We reconsole this data and 30 seconds later, we had semantics in our spreadsheet. We enrich the data set with this information we found in the uh, Wikipedia. We created a unique identifier for each row. The data was ready to be exported to JSON. 
the JSON file I told you that was uh, necessary to create the database. Now that we have the database, you can start cloning the project or forking the, the project to uh, your own repository. You will find the database under the docs folder and also the quick app code, open the code of the quick app in the quick app ID. You will find something like this. And uh, the only thing you want to, to uh, modify at the beginning is just the manifest. Also, you want to rewrite the app logo and the icon, the descriptions, uh, the attributions, whatever you want in your application. And you can just paste the points of interest you got in the previous stage, install the dependencies using NPM, just click on this button, and in some seconds, you will be able to connect your device and uh, run the first test, and you can see something like this. This is the information we got and also mixed with the Wikipedia, as you can see. Also, you can see here the map. So, yeah, do it yourself. Just uh, access to the, our repository, uh, grab the code and play with your own ideas. Thank you. What will mobile look like in the future and how best to... Thank you everyone for joining us for this live panel. Um, I'm joined today with uh, a very exciting uh, group of people. Um, going around the table, we have Thomas Steiner, who is a well, nice wave, developer relations on Project Fugu for Google. We have Ilke Aden, CEO and founder of Famobi Games. Hello. Sylvain Lebon, CEO and founder of Starting Blocks. And Gail Duval, CEO and founder of uh, the E Foundation. And Murina, and many other things. Um, okay, so I'd like to uh, just uh, let everyone know that it is a live panel. So if you have questions, please do post them. We will try to reply to as many of them as possible. Um, but of course, we have a few questions just to kickstart the discussion. Um, now, obviously, you know, I've been thinking about this kind of live panel and the, some of the subjects that we're going to be looking at and the whole question about, you know, what is mobile going to look like in the future? And I, I think one of the things that comes to mind is this notion that, um, you know, big tech um, and platforms are looking to uh, constantly evolve and revolutionize the way we use our devices. Um, and we see a certain kind of bring coming together of uh, what would be traditionally called you know, mobile applications or web or desktop. And I, I'd like to pose a question to Thomas and really kind of see what he thinks is driving this, uh, this trend. Um, does he think it is a kind of a, a realization that maybe mobile app uh, technologies that are currently being used are becoming uh, tired in some ways? Or is there a movement towards blurring the boundaries between our devices? Um, and uh, how might this impact developers going forward? I mean, traditionally, we have different platforms. Now we have this blurring of platforms. What's happening? So, Thomas. A couple of very big questions for you. Yeah, I could talk for hours about this. Uh, I try to be brief. Um, so I work um, at a big company that works with, in turn, a lot of big uh, other companies. And um, something that we see is um, a lot of these big companies have a desire to reduce their development cost, which mm -hmm. is um, why we see um, a lot of people interested in technologies like Flutter, for example, so they want to build once with Flutter and then roll it out to all the uh, platforms, mobile, desktop, um, what have you. Um, and we also see, just in general, um, still on web, there's a lot of um, yeah, new technologies that people need, so new APIs that people need, which is why uh, on my team, which is the Project Fogo team, um, we try to enable um, developers to do all cool. the things um, they want to um, do in, um, the, uh, on the web platform with um, the missing features um, that we are adding to the browser. So um, one of the recent um, big uh, launches was uh, Adobe Photoshop, um, who like I personally was 
considering as one of the apps that would never be on the web. And here we are uh, in 2022 with uh, a version of Photoshop. It's not the full, full version of what you get when you install the native application, but definitely it's a, a very well working version of Photoshop on the web. And um, it was enabled by um, just new features that we added to the platform, like for example, um, performant access to files, um, something that wasn't possible before. You could of course upload and download files um, to a server. Um, you could work somewhat with files on a client, um, but what, what was missing really was this kind of super high performance access to um, something that Adobe internally uses, which is uh, sort of a, a swap file um, where they can manage uh, gigabytes of Photoshop data in memory um, that could then be swapped to disk. And of course, um, things running in the browser, um, RAM always is a concern. So at some point, you need to swap out uh, to disk. And um, yeah, Adobe was yeah. missing um, one of the foundational primitives there, and uh, the front team built it. Safari adopted it, and now also Firefox adopted. So um, yeah. by just do, uh, looking what partners need, we try to um, yeah make more things possible on the web platform. So, so what what do you feel is maybe driving this push towards having that blurred boundary between kind of the web and what would be traditionally desktop and also mobile applications? And this is a question that, of course, anyone on the panel can answer. Open question. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll follow up with that question if no one has a traditional com any other comments. So you know, if we uh, if we the are the boring answer is simply money. Um, if you don't yeah. have to build for iOS and for Android and for Windows and for Mac and just build once, you save a lot of money. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the boring question. Uh, sorry, the boring answer. Um, but maybe someone else has uh, different experiences, more exciting answers. They're very quiet on that one. Um, I'm wondering. I, mean, I think yeah. we were not prepared for that. If you like, ask the same question again. I'm I'm pretty sure we can come up with some more exciting answers than Thomas answered. <laughs> be, be nice, Ilka. Um, you know, I think I think there's a question there about the these trends towards having a move, more fluid experience between what we would do traditionally on a desktop or what we now do in a browser, what we do in a mobile application and trying to remove the boundaries between those. Um, but for me, that, that gives rise to a kind of a, a, a slightly different question, which is I think something of importance when we look at open source, we're in an open source conference here, and it's around the notion of digital sovereignty, um, having the freedom of choice not just in the platforms we use, but also the obviously the devices we're using. Um, and I know that Gail has also been looking at this question of uh, digital sovereignty, freedoms of choice and uh, data privacy. And I'd like to have his take on how he feels that that question um, you know, is, is important today. Why is it important today? And how is the E Foundation really looking at that question? All right. Uh, thank you for the question, Christian. Um, uh, I think it's uh, many questions actually uh, in, into your question. Um, so I'm not sure where to start. Um, um, what today there is um, there are many questions about um, how data uh, from users uh, is uh, collected and used. And uh, for what purpose? And uh, that leads immediately to the questions of the, um, you know, the the economy uh, that is behind uh, all this and um, the, the business models. Um, on our own, we think that uh, uh, users, um, the, the the permanent uh, data harvesting, users data harvesting, uh, that is happening. Um, on the web and in the, in the smartphones uh, is not acceptable anymore uh, for many reasons. Uh, we think that uh, uh, at some point uh, it can even threaten, uh, you know, uh, uh, democracy and, uh, and freedom. And that's why uh, we have this slogan now, choose freedom. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we do some products that uh, protect actually uh, the user's personal data uh, that give them uh, some guarantees. Uh, that their data uh, is going to, to stay their data and uh, 
stay private and uh, secure. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is our mission and uh, that is uh, what uh, led our, our development uh, um, roadmap. Um, I think that also uh, in terms of, um, you are talking about uh, digital sovereignty and I'm not sure that um, um, sovereignty is, is always the good word because yeah, it, it has some connotation sometimes, but um, um, I prefer to, 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 to talk, to speak about, uh, you know, strategic independency, uh, for instance. And uh, what, what is strategic independency? It's, it's the, the control you can have on software. Uh, for instance, if, you, if we are t talking about software, it's um, how deep you can go into the software to understand uh, in the details what it's doing and um, to, to, to which point you can control the software and modify it for, for your own um, need or your own uh, purpose. And the, the third point is uh, about this independence is, is to be able to, to have a total, um, you know, uh, to avoid any um, need to have a third party uh, to, to control your software. So you, you, you can do it yourself. So the, that is the, the three pillars, in my opinion, of the um, uh, uh, technological um, um, independency. Um, and if you think really about it, I think that uh, open source is a key uh, to make this possible uh, because it's a way to share software, software and knowledge and, and to not depend on someone or something to make this uh, software work and, uh, and, um, and uh, make progress and, uh, and become better so um... yeah thank you thank you gail but from an an app de developer's perspective so ilka you know do, do do you does this kind of what gail is saying does that um ring a bell with you does that kind of chime with your experiences uh the notion of a strategic independence around software I mean, software for me is just a tool. I mean, of course, software is key. You know, all of us, we like deal with software. The main uh, discussion today is about the software. Uh, nevertheless, I'm focused on end products. So I'm, I'm seeing the, the user like. So what, I, what we try to do as a company is always to adapt to the user behavior. So Thomas' feedback was like more from de developer's perspective, the costs. Mm -hmm. So you said it's a it's a... A boring answer but it's one of the main answers right so it's all about we are the developers we need to like take cost into consideration but on the other hand if you look at the user's perspective so this is where we need to go to so they're impatient they're like on roads so they're here they have the smartphones they need easy and fast access and we need to come up with technical solutions and like the, the ow2 like everything which is about open source, anything which supports this to satisfy the needs of the user, the end consumer, this is like perfect. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're trying to use like any of these tools and opportunities to satisfy user needs. Okay. And, and you're, you're actually in a really interesting position because you have created a, a gaming company um, that's really focused on kind of the web technologies um, but you're also using quick apps. And I wonder if you could kind of give some thoughts and in some insights to the people listening about, you know, why you chose this route and, and you know, what do you think it will lead to in the future? I mean, here in Germany is right now heavily raining. I don't know if you hear the background noise. <laughs> do you hear no. me well? No, no. You, hear, you don't hear me well? No. We don't hear the background noise. Okay, cool. So basically, we are a game development studio. But what makes us different from other like standard studios, we provide like lightweight content, like snacky content, so, like small file sizes. And um, the average time spent is much lower than you sit in front of a console and a TV and you spend a couple of hours. So our average time spent is like, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour. This is it. And mobile usage is like perfectly suitable for that. And the technology we're using is also web and lightweight technologies, including like quick apps. 
So all this together fits perfectly well. Fantastic. And your experience with Quick Apps as a, from a developer and publisher perspective? I mean, first of all, of course, we need to kind of a uh, short like adaptation phase. I mean, we are already using web, to web technologies and JavaScript. Of course, like Quick Apps uh, have their own technical requirements, but it's like the onboarding is quite fast and quick. And the outcome and the advantages to reach more people in a faster way, it's worth it. Mm, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so if we also think about that question, I'm coming back to the question of kind of the uh, various platforms and uh, are spreading across devices and the notion of, uh, you know, uh, uh, controlling data and how data is consolidated uh, within platforms. I think, you know, here there's a natural uh, question for Sylvain, because I know he's at the forefront of looking at this question. Um, and I would like him to give us some insights into how he approaches the question of uh, data ownership um, and what his company starting blocks are doing there. Sure. Um, so Startup Blocks is developing a technology that enables um, web developers to build apps that uh, um, are based on, in, on a decentralized um, architecture. That means that the data can be stored somewhere and accessed from anywhere. So basically, the, the consequence of that is that we can have uh, some data um, some, some applications that connect to data uh, in other places and all and like all applications can connect to data anywhere they are so we basically uh, separate the data the application on one side from the data storage on the other side uh, compared to what the platform is today and that um, that leads us to an architecture uh, closer to what we know in a in the mobile world, for example, where the app is on your phone and accessing data um, on another server. And um, with the standards we use, that means that the, basically the app can connect to different servers and the users of different apps can interact through different apps. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, from a data perspective, we're looking at kind of the uh, that diffusion, that decentralization of data and maybe uh, how it's owned by the users and, and controlled, um, which also, uh, of course, ties in well to that, that initial kind of sentence I made around this kind of blurring of boundaries between the platforms. Um, and I think, you know, Ilko is also saying, you know, users, they're much more on the go today. Uh, they want to get stuff done. They want it quickly done. They're going to use the, 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 the device that's in their hand or readily available. And that device could be a mobile phone, but, you know, it could also be a desktop or a tablet or, you know, whatever it is that they're using. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's extremely interesting. So, do, you know, if we if we take this back to kind of an opportunity perspective, um, you know, I just... A general question and you know for the audience this is not at all a prepared question where do you see this all going over the next few years um <laughs> that's a tough question um i'd say that um the, the web as it, as it has been built uh, in the last few years has uh, been centralized again uh, around uh, a few platforms that we we use um, and basically it tends to go to bigger and bigger platforms which means fewer and fewer um, um, alternatives for for consumers um, i think the trend now is and, and that's what people call web3 is a decentralization trend mm -hmm. where um, people get more uh, choice in what apps they use and can use uh, an app without like today. If you use an app, you have to give a, to give in all your data to that app, and to stay inside this app and only communicate with uh, users of that app. Um, I think that the trend is to towards um, more apps that are able to communicate with each other, which means that users can have apps that are more adapted to their needs, and. Um, 
and with the controlling where the, the data is stored and how it is used. And, and, and in, in Iqua, how, how do you how do you see the kind of this trend evolving? Uh, I think Sylvan mentioned actually there a, a really important um, phrase he talked about this sort of consolidation of data within you know kind of the big players. Um, I, you know, I suspect if we don't talk about consolidation of of data, but we talk about maybe consolidation of uh, market access and things like that. Um, there must be also uh, areas that you would like to see evolve um, along with this kind of fusion in of boundaries and uh, increasing uh, access that people would like uh, on, on the on the go access that people would like. So how, how do you see that? How do you see this kind of evolution um, and the big players versus the small players, for example? Is that question for me, Christian? It is for you, yeah. Sorry, it's a bit of a rambling question. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I love this kind of open question. So I love to discuss about technologies. So this is what I breathe, you know, technology. It's all about that. I mean, products we have, like for the last couple of years, always the same products, same games. You know, we have produced solitaire games 20 years ago. Today, we're still producing called solitaire games. The only thing what changes is technology and the way you, you access it. I mean... I'm not aware of the Chinese market, for example. There I know that everything is done through WeChat. This is what I heard. I've never been there. It's like one entrance point. So there's one big gatekeeper with all that payment tools, e-commerce, and whatever you do. Uh, here in Europe, we have, or let's say in the US, it's like partly like this. Like you have, I don't know, like if you have your Facebook login, you know, you can use it to like access different services. There are different type of, I don't know, whatever logins you have, like Google login and so on. Like still, like these are the gatekeepers. Uh, but in general, I think what should be like more decentralized is like the fast, quick access to like the product of that, like, yeah, the the the, the provider. Let's say there is a e-commerce platform. You're just like on the go. You see an ad. You just quickly scan the QR code. You are directly on the website. And the, the payment, everything should be as easy as possible because these kind of opportunities, they drive the conversion rate. All right. So that means, let, let's say I see, I don't know, a T-shirt somewhere. It's like, wow, I'm, I don't know, in France, in Paris. Like I see there is a shop, whatever, I can directly scan, buy it and, and pay it. So this is for me kind of opportunity. I don't need to like invest time and I have it immediately. But if, if I need to install something, if I need to register, I would say, damn, it's not worth it for a 20 years of T-shirt yeah. to invest like five to 10 minutes of my lifetime. So mm. it's not in balance. So mm. everything what we do right now here is like, you know, driving higher conversion rate with this type of lightweight and quick access, like quick yeah. apps. And do you do you think also? I mean, and you know, uh, the others on the call can please, you know, um, answer as well. But do do you think there's a question around, you know, how we open up the market access for more players and that we increase the distribution channels? I mean, you've talked about like you know QR codes. I just want to snap a QR code and get bounced over to a quick app or to a web page or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's also in some respects, I mean, if we talked about kind of the traditional app models, we might be thinking of, well, I'm being bounced over to a traditional app, but that's within a store. You know, have I gone through the store process and all of this kind of stuff? So, you know, is there, as well as the fusioning of device and the immediacy of access, is there a need to open out from your perspectives um, how we use these different uh, channels um, and, uh, and and the routes to distributing uh, applications. You're probably going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost all sound from you, Ilka. Yeah, it's again me. Okay, I mean, of course I can. Um... But as, as, an, as an app publisher, I'm interested in your voice. But of course, you know, Gail, I'm sure you have an opinion on this uh, as well, and maybe even Thomas. So, you know, please, everyone, feel free to answer. Yeah, yes, but we, we have different, uh, you know, uh, business here. And uh, yeah. uh, the, the benefit I see, for instance, with mini apps or quick apps 
is different uh, probably uh, than the benefit uh, from a liqueur or, or, or the others on this uh, panel. Um, for us, the benefit of, of uh, this uh, new technology, uh, mini apps or quick apps, for us is uh, is uh, mostly a, a promise, you know, to have something um, that 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 will give more um, uh, more choice to developers and apps publishers and uh, to escape the big uh, the big platforms. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, uh, conversion, etc., uh, I'm not in this business, so I don't have uh, a lot of command. But maybe maybe I could show you um, quickly. Uh, something uh, if I can share my screen just to talk about you know um, the personal data yeah you know you, you see something now we do yeah so you, you see the advanced privacy this is a new software we have in uh, EOS v1 and it shows uh, actually the number of uh, trackers that are active uh, within the operating system over time. So if you go into the details, uh, you see that actually uh, applications that you use that are on the OS uh, are using uh, a huge number of trackers. And uh, just look at some figures and you see, for instance, on uh, June 7, that was yesterday, uh, you have uh, 14 more close to 15,000 uh, trackers access that have been blocked on my device. So um, this is really something uh, that uh, people, are, users are not aware about. And, um, and, and, and we want to, 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 to explain about this and, uh, and, and we want to give more options and more control to users and application publishers. And we think that many apps and quick apps um, we are helping uh, us to do this, to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for that. Now, there is actually a question in the chat. So I'm going to read the question out and whoever would like to answer, please do. Uh, do you, this comes from Anton, uh, Antoine Mottier. Uh, do you think that we will see in future some standards at low level, for example, the operating system, or do we, uh, or will we have more uh, and more encapsulation uh, in order to isolate um, software away from the low-level services? So that's kind of a complex question. I mean, let, let's, yeah. let's, I mean, we're like the dinosaurs of the industry, right? Oh, okay, Thomas, I mean, you can also get, let, I will let, keep it very short. If I look back like 20 years, let's say, um, if I look at all the browsers, you know, the evolution of browsers, the Internet Explorer, the Firefox, the Chrome, and so on. I mean, we, even when I was developing web, websites by, by my own, I always needed to check different browsers. It's the same code, but it's differently interpreted by different browsers. For sure. And it's still the same. Like yesterday, I went like to a self-order restaurant, like where they have their own booking system, like online. You open it in, uh, it was opened uh, in a kind of native browser on my device. It was completely destroyed. Then I needed to copy paste the link into Google Chrome and so it worked again. Mm -hmm. So that means still, so I have the feeling that we will like also in the next 20 years not have a like of unique standard. So they will all, always be kind of, yeah, like overlapping of standards. But uh, I mean, when developing products, and developing software, you always need to have tons of different test devices to see if your product really works on, on this. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump in on this rather than be the moderator. I take my moderator hat off. I think there's one of the one of the areas of quick apps that's interesting is that it's an implementation of the W3, uh, W3C mini app standards, um, which are pushing towards kind of a normalization of the, the developer level uh, API set in order to extract away from that problem. Um, and I think that's, you know, Thomas, you've probably seen exactly this kind of problem as well from a developer perspective, right? Um, yeah, so I was about to say, um, the sandbox that the web browser provides you with is kind of, um, this isolation that I think the uh, question was about, um, it can make the topic or, or open the topic of uh, inter interoperability and compatibility. Um, there's actually a huge effort in place um, under the hashtag of interop2022, um, where 
all the big uh, browser vendors got together, agreed on a set of uh, most uh, painful developer pains. Um, we are working on fixing those. And uh, if you go to the uh, dashboard, you can actually see that um, with every release of each browser vendor, um, there's progress being made. So um, definitely, it's top of mind. It's a, a massive developer pain, but there's a lot of progress. So um, I think you cannot really fairly compare, um, let's say, the web of the, uh, let's say, uh, 2010s uh, with today's web. Um, there has been a lot of progress. Um, what people have not been fully aware of is that there has been progress. So a lot of people still don't assume that something like Grid or Flex works. Um, there's still massive knowledge gaps where people are just stuck in their mindsets from the 2010s or whatever. So um, I think this is something we need to overcome. But yeah, there are compatibility compatibility issues, but they're being worked on. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, any more questions in the audience? I'll just uh, throw it out to the audience there. No. Okay. So while the audience is uh, deliberating on how to challenge you guys with something difficult, I'm going to give you all an easy question um, and be, I'm going to put my uh, quick app hat on and say, will quick apps move the needle? Are they an opportunity for you and will they move the needle? Open question. Definitely from technology perspective, yes, this is what is needed. So the quick, like it says quick apps, it's like quick access. This is what nowadays people need. It's only about the first like big mover. So some like big, nice use case, which is needed on the market. Okay. And this would move the needle for sure. Excellent. Thank you, Ilka. Sylvan or Gail, any thoughts on that one? No. I, I'd say that, um, sure, uh, the, I mean, the, I think the, the, the whole thing about, well, I mean, mobile uh, web exists on mobile already. So the, 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 the whole point of Quick Apps is to um, improve the user experience on mobile uh, for, from a web perspective and to add features to the user. So I, yeah, I think it has the, the possibility, the, the opportunity to to happen new features to what can be done on mobile web. So I would say yes in, in that that way. Thank you. Um, to inverse the question, what would be for you the biggest challenges in order to see uh, technology like Quick Apps um, make a difference in people's lights so that when people are using quick apps they have this fluid experience but what's the challenge i guess that if you take the the publisher uh, perspective uh, uh well, there is um, a question about uh, how your application is going to be distributed so uh i mean the question here is uh, is apple and google uh, uh, uh are, are they uh are apple and google uh, um, integrating this technology and uh, to offer our publishers uh, the opportunity to to grow through, through their platform because if you if if you don't have this uh, it's going to be a tough choice for developers to to bet on quick apps because they know that uh, and they have to to rely uh, uh, mostly on the Huawei uh, uh, app store or uh, they, they they have to to bundle this in a um, runtime to be able to run on Android or, or you know, otherwise they just, they, they can just use this on the, in a web browser. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very limit, limiting in terms of uh, impact. So I, I think that's the main question today. Are Apple and Google going to embrace this technology? Good answer. I'm not going to, I can't answer on their behalf. Thomas? I think one of, one of the big challenges with any of these kind of technologies is um, they're introducing gatekeepers. If you want to build an app that is something that is not in line with the gatekeeper's vision, um, they will stop publishing your app or even kick you out of whatever marketplace, app store, um, which is not great. Whereas if you can just take a web server, buy a domain, and um, be somewhere on the web accessible for everyone, um, that's a different story. There's, there's no gatekeepers involved. Um, Will quick apps move the needle? So I think I'm, I'm a web person. So um, 
I do look or did look at many apps um, in general, and I think there's a ton um, the web can learn from them. Um, so I think in that sense, um, yes, they can move the needle. Um, I do hope that, um, yeah, we as the web community take many apps for inspiration, take some of the great ideas um, that um, the many apps community have uh, created around, for example, how apps are built, um, what kind of components people have. Um, but then also in some terms, um, there are certain ways how people need to build mini apps. Um, you couldn't imagine something like the GeoCities uh, ecosystem uh, on mini apps, right? So because mm -hmm. many apps uh, on the stores, you have sort of some expectations how many apps should look like. There's uh, UI guidelines that you need to respect in order to even become uh, on the market, uh, be become accepted on the market. So um, I think it loses also some creativity because there's this enforcement how um, certain guidelines need to be uh, applied or not. And um, on the web, there there is no such uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I interesting comment. Actually, I'm gonna give one, I'm just gonna give a question back to you, Thomas. You know, when you're talking, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, what you're saying is making sense. Um, but it, it's very interesting because, you know, you're very much supporting this notion of uh, the mobile web experience or the web experience as a way of having this kind of uh, access to applications. So I, I guess implicitly you're also aligning with the, uh, with the kind of my statement at the beginning that there is a certain uh, fatigue um, or end of the road syndrome um, coming up for uh, application for traditional applications, right? Sorry, just needed to open the door. <laughs> um, there, there, yeah. So live panels and remote access. <laughs> working from home. The joys of working from home. Um, yes. So um, there. Well, it's a very open-ended question, and it's one where strong views are uh, held by different parties. Um, I want to try to be diplomatic. So um, I think um, we can learn a lot from, from these initiatives, um, but it's also sort of a threat because um, we already have an open system. So um, everyone can build websites. Everyone can build um, components for websites. Um, you can invent the next jQuery if you want to, and um, you can just... Uh, throw it out there and uh, everyone can use it. Um, if people say, look, there's this new initiative, there's this new uh, open source initiative, um, great, but we already have one. So I think um, it's great to take inspiration from different angles and different ends. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I don't think necessarily um, it's the only answer. Very nice answer. Okay, so we're coming up to the close of this uh, discussion. We were allotted uh, 40 minutes, I believe, initially. Um, so that gives us a couple of minutes left. Does anyone on the uh, or in the audience, um, does anyone have a question? I've seen a comment, but no questions. Um, so last question from the audience. No, well, they have a 20 second delay, right? I'm not sure if that's 20 seconds. Okay, so we're going to leave that there. So I would like to very much thank the panelists for today. Interesting discussion, a lot of points that have been covered. We haven't had time to really dig into all of the points, of course. There's a whole, whole panel of different uh, subjects that have been uh, uh touched upon. Um, I hope this has given uh, all of you watching uh, an interest in what's happening in web technologies and of course in quick apps. Uh, for those interested, there is the OW2 quick app initiative. Um, I'm sure you'll find the link fairly easily on the OW2 website. And again, thank you to all our panelists um, and for everyone watching, have a great end of conference and a nice evening. So long. <laughs>